Shauna, I think I goofed. Down because otherwise. Good evening. It's really delightful to see all these people in the town room and particularly people who work for the town of Amherst and keep us safe. So we're having a swearing in tonight and then we're going to go on to our formal meeting. So the good news is you don't have to listen to me call the meeting to order, read the riot act and call on everybody's name. This part of the meeting is open to the public, but we're not doing it as an official council meeting. So I'm seeing various groups and various leaders of our uh, first responders. And I believe the way I was handed the agenda, we're going to start with Cress. So Earl, come on up and Sue as our clerk, Town clerk, please join us. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Um, so I'm trying to figure out which direction we should face. We should we go this way? Face All right. That way. Uh, so hello, I'm Earl Miller. Uh, what a wonderful privilege to be at a town council meeting. This is my first chance to do this. Um, I'm going to introduce Tia, but first I really want to introduce the entire department. Um, so today we have Apollo, Tim, Rome. Q, Brittany, Vanessa, Kevon, and Kat, who are not able to be with us today. Uh, what a privilege to stand on the shoulders of these fine folks we have in the room. Uh, Crest is only going to be a success because of the police department and fire department. Anybody who thinks that there could be any space between us is wrong. And I want you guys to know that today. Um, we are here and we will be successful because of the sacrifices you made, because we have two wonderful leaders like Chief Livingstone and Chief Nelson, who mentor us and put their work into our department every day. So I'm grateful for you all. And what an honor to be here with you. Uh, Tia is uh, probably the youngest person in the room, 20. Um, I've often been asked what makes a good responder. And we don't quite yet have an academy like you all, so we have to figure it out ourselves. Um, what I know is that it's caring about human beings. It's caring about people when it's hard. It's loving the folks in our community who don't have anyone else and being willing to, to honor our word. Uh, the greatest compliment I can pay to Tia is if she tells you she's gonna do something, you can count it as done. Um, she's driving in from the Berkshires here every day. It's a long commute. Um, and she's doing everything she can to learn. We are privileged to have her, and the town is privileged to have her. I often think of Chief Livingstone when I think about her as someone who's coming into the town very young and is going to have a long time to put their mark on this place. And if she lives up to any of the things you've done here, we'll all be better for it. Thank you all. And Sue Odette, our cl town clerk, will now swear you in. Can you raise your right hand, please? Do you solemnly swear or affirm to faithfully and impartially perform the duties incumbent upon you as a Crest employee? Congratulations. So next is Chief Nelson. Just to, ah, okay, there we go. I got it. Sit down. <laughs> anyway, uh, good evening. Hey, uh, first I'm, I want to talk talk or talk about two two folks that aren't aren't here. One, uh, Audrey Bol Bolger, uh, brand 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 new to us. Uh, she began with us as a stu student fire, fire, firefighter, called her college while well, you. Uh, U, U, UMass uh, fin and uh, was uh, joined joined us, and she found out that she kind of like like hanging hanging out with with us. So uh, again, she's brand 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 new. She's 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 going to be great. Uh, we have our other um, we have have another medic uh, Madeline Burke, 
who uh, she had, she had 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 a point 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 for him, but tonight that she 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 could, couldn't miss. But she's local 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 girl, long 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 meadow. Uh, new new meadow um, medic was work working in Pel Pelham, and thought and got the uh, fire firebug. Uh, she rode with with, with us during during her train 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 tra training. She like liked us. We like liked her. Kind of worked. It's great. And so and she's she's gonna be another 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 great 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 one for for the town and us. And we've got these three. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> first, Cassandra, Cassandra, Sandra, Co 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 Cody. She began with, with us as a stu student, fire from a firefighter, you, the, the UMass grad. I uh, was kind of try, trying to figure out what what she wanted wanted to do with her life, and she kind of kind of found you know, Amherst Fire Fire, fire, fire and uh, kind of hooked on with 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 us, and she's do, doing great. Uh, she's in med in medic school school now, and she's very very shy, <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> But again, an, another great, 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 great addition. And one of the things that that I, I like, I like, like to brag, brag about is we attract really good, good people here. We really, really do. I'm, I'm the luck, luckiest guy, 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 guy around because I get to work, work with all, all, all these folks every day. And we have uh, Stone with Stone Kirk for Curry, uh, the easy, the easy Eastern Mass guy. We won't hold that again, again against them. The end. Of the interesting thing, the thing is when he went to went to med. med Medic school. One of his instructors was a former former fire fire medic here, and he said, "You know, you would do well to come come out west, take the ride, ride with the Amherst for for for, for a while." I think you, he he said he thought thought thought, thought he might might like like it. He came came out, found found that that it was a good good fit. We know he's going to be be a good good fit. So and, and we're glad glad glad, glad to have uh, have him here. Uh, uh, Stone, of course, for those that, that are old enough to to remember, I guess he he was named 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 for the A the A the A the ABC report Porter Stone Phil, Phil, Phil Phillips. If folks if folks if folks are old enough to remember remember him, so that's a, a little fun fun fact. And then we have Alex. Alex, get, guess what? I got it right. I got it right. Close, close enough. Okay. Um, Alex comes comes from us comes us from upstate New 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 York. Uh, Went to, went to Stones, 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 Stony Brook. We won't hold that again, again against them either, either. But came came down here from medic school. Uh, uh, thought 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 about the area, area area was a good good place to be. Good good place place to learn. Uh, good good place place to set set down roots. Uh, he said he he did, he uh, came and rode and rode rode with us during, during the strain of the training time. Uh, impressed pre 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 us as all as 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 they all did, and you know we we did, we decided, decided decided to bring 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 him on board. Once you get get to know know him, you'll find that he's pretty kind of he's pretty shy, pretty uh, kind of kind of kind of retired, retired, retiring. Doesn't say say much 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 at all. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, but anyway, but again, uh, we're lucky, lucky, lucky to have all, all, all five, five of these folks. Are, uh, it's extreme, extreme, extremely so. And they're going to be a great, great addition to the department and great for, for the town and even more, more, more so for, for the people, the people in, in town. So without ado. Sue, come on up. I'll be on the um, please stand up and join us in front of Sue. Yeah. If you all can raise your right hands, please. Do you all solemnly swear or affirm to faithfully and impartially perform the duties incumbent upon you as firefighters for the town of Amherst? Congratulations. And Scott Livingstone, Chief Livingstone, come on in.
Good evening, everybody, and thank you to the town manager and for all the town councilors for hosting us tonight for this important swearing in. I am gonna do things a little different. I'm gonna prepare our new officers, Josh, Dylan, and uh, Genesis to come on up and say a few words about yourself. They, uh, if you would join me first, please up here, but I'll tell you a little bit about their training. I think uh, for those of you that have participated in our recruitment process, you know it's very rigorous. Our HR department takes very uh, takes part of it. Town manager is part of the interviews, and we have a lot of other uh, processes. But they completed their their graduation on November twelfth, was it? Yes, twenty two weeks of training, and they have just completed phase one of their in house training, which is fourteen more weeks. And then if everything goes as planned, they will be out on their own and um, much needed and, and certainly will, it will be well-deserved. So I'm going to prepare you a little bit for your future testimony in court. So get rid of some of your shyness right away. So if you would just say a couple of words about uh, where you're from and, and your, your interest and that sort of thing, and we'll move on. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Genesis from Springfield. Um, it's a privilege to be here. Thank you for having me. And I look forward to working with everyone and serving the town of Amherst. And yeah. And I'm Josh Santos uh, from Ludlow. I was in the Air Force about seven years uh, as military police. So I couldn't have hoped for something better than this. Already having a blast learning about the town and my FTO is back there right now, my field training officer, teaching me the ropes, but yeah, I look forward to the future. How are we doing, everybody? I'm Dylan Tucci. I'm 28. I'm also from upstate New York. Um, I want to thank the town manager, the police department for this opportunity. I really look forward to working with everybody in Amherst and for the people of Amherst. It's really an exciting opportunity that I can't wait to take full advantage of. Hello. No, you can't leave yet. Okay. Hi again. Right. And if you could all please raise your right hand, please. Do you all solemnly swear or affirm to faithfully and impartially perform the duties incumbent upon you as the police officers for the town of Amherst? Congratulations. And again, we want to congratulate all of you and wait, wait, wait. we're going to just for them have some informal time for counselors to say hello and no. so forth. And we will begin our One more thing. time out. Oh, uh, let's bring it. her on up. Say a few words about yourself. <laughs> Go ahead. Not you. Hold oh, this. God. Go ahead. <laughs> Thanks for coming, everyone. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Chief, um, for all your help. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so, Audrey, you have to turn around and be sworn in. Okay, if you can raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm to faithfully and impartially perform the duties incumbent upon you as a firefighter? Congratulations. Maybe others have seen people sworn in as they come in out of the field, but <laughs> it's the first time I've seen it. Thanks for joining us. Glad you could. So we have Thanks one, we have to one all more, of you. Go more, ahead. We have one more th thing. We, I'd like to introduce our new director of so. human resources. Right. Uh, Melissa DJ Walker. And, and if appropriate, I'd also like to welcome the chair of our personnel board, Tony Butterfield, who made time to come tonight. So Tony. 
to say a few words? Thank you, everyone. I just wanted to say a quick thank you and um, let you know how happy I am to be here with you today. This is quite an honor to watch the swearing in. It was a very exciting first day. Not only did I get to watch the swearing in, but I got to go to a holiday buffet. So uh, it was wonderful. I really look forward to the good work that is to be done here. And um, I'm honored. So thank you so much. Anything else? Are you sure? No more surprises in the audience. Thank you all. But we're going to now spend a little time, talk with you, and we will begin our council meeting promptly at 5.30, where we do the state of the town tonight, which is in good shape. Go.
This is your five minute warning to clear the room. So, Anna, are you ready? Are you already on? Okay. I don't. I don't see you. There you are. Got it. So Pam Rooney's on. Anika's on. Mandy Joe's on. Andy Steinberg's on. Welcome. Okay. Um, so Athena, let's remove the screen and get ready to, are we starting a new tape? Okay. So we are already recording, correct? Okay. I will wait till 5.30.
Good evening. It is December 19th, 2022. This is a regular meeting of the town council and includes the state of the town addresses. On November 7th, 2022, an act was signed into law which extended the suspension of certain provisions of the open meeting law. That is what allows us to meet both in person and virtually. You can be either with us in the town room, you can be with us by Zoom, by phone, or watch us on Amherst Media. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm calling the December 19th, 2022 town council meeting to order at six at 5.30. I will call upon each counselor um, by name. At that time, you should unmute your mic and say present. This will indicate that we can hear, you can hear us and we can hear you. Please remember to mute your mic when we complete. Uh, Shalini Ball Milne is present, is absent at this point. Uh, Pat DeAngelis. Present. Anad, Anika Lopes. No, I'm sorry, I skipped a whole line. Anna Devlin Gothier. Present. Lynn Griesmer is present. Mandy Johannick. Present. Anika Lopes. Present. Michelle Miller. Present. Dorothy Pam. I, she's on her way and I'm sure she will be with us. Um, Pam Rooney. Present. Kathy Shane. Here. Andy Steinberg. Present. Jennifer Todd. Present. Alicia Walker. She's in the uh, she, Please bring her in from the audience. Good evening, Alicia. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. Okay. And somebody keep an eye out for when Dorothy Pam joins us and also if Shalini joins us. She's not joining tonight. Okay. Thank you. There is no chat room for this meeting. If you have technical issues, please let Athena and me know, and we will decide what to do with those difficulties. Uh, please also, when you want to make a comment or ask a question, use the raise. Dorothy's in the audience now. Use the raise hand function. Please bring Dorothy in. Hi, Dorothy. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for being with us earlier. Uh, you're with us also now, but in a different way. Um, all right, so there are 12 counselors present tonight, and we are going to proceed with the announcements. You want to put them up on the screen? This is our last council meeting of the year. The next time we meet will be January 9th at 6.30. Meantime, our committees are continuing to meet and you can see them up on the screen. I wanna point out because this has just been decided earlier that the GOL or Governance Organization and Legislation Committee on January 4th, 2023, which meets at 9 a.m. will be a committee of the whole. If there are people that are not able to make that meeting, the purpose will be to discuss the town manager's goals and look at some of the issues that um, Councillor Miller is going to explain to us later are in the parking lot. Anika, you have your hand up? Oops, no. Thank you. The TSO meeting for December 22nd has been canceled. In addition to that, we wanna call attention to the fact that there will be community forums about the proposed new Amherst Elementary School. Those community forums will be on Wednesday, January 25th at 2023 uh, at 8.30 a.m. and Thursday, January 26th at 6.30 p.m. And we will continue to make sure the information about those are broadly um, sent out. In addition to that, several counselors have included information about the school at their district meeting, but may choose to do so again in January, February, and March. 
with that, we're going to actually go straight to the um, State of the Town Address. And there's actually five parts to this evening, and we'll explain that in just a moment. Thank you. You can go to the next slide, please. Charter section 2.2 .2 requires that each year the council president and the town manager address the elected bodies, officials of the town and the public on the state affairs of the town. Tonight, we are joined by Jones Library Director, Sharon Sherry who is here on behalf of the trustees. We are joined by Allison McDonald, who is the chair of the elementary school committee. And as a special feature this year, we will have a brief preview of a topic that will be a part of our 2023 serious conversations. That is for coming from Kathy Shane, chair of the elementary school building committee and a counselor in district one. Next slide. This is the fourth state of the town address that I've given, and it continues to be an honor and privilege to serve as the president of the town council. Next slide. Please allow me to focus on the town manager and our standing town staff and express appreciation for others as well. We want to sincerely, sincerely express our appreciation of our town staff. Earlier, we swore in some new first responders for police, fire, and EMS, and new CREST team as well. Part of that response team also includes the Department of Public Works. In addition to that, there are many other town departments that serve us every day. Our town staff keeps government moving. We recently completed the town manager's evaluation. He continues to receive predominantly commendable and satisfactory ratings. Amherst is challenging, yet because of the town manager and his staff, we are ahead of the curve. Continuing to serve as clerk of the town council is Athena O'Keefe. She serves the town council in countless ways. Without hesitation, she helps all of us stay on track and is a valued resource. We also want to recognize the many town committees their chairs, their members, and the town staff that serve them. The members of our town apply to be on our many committees. They share their expertise in areas such as water supply and contamination, solar, energy and climate action, housing, personnel, just to name a few areas. On behalf of the town council and the town of Amherst, we thank you for your past and ongoing service your willingness to provide us with sound advice and put up with our far raging, ranging issues is greatly appreciated. We wish to express our appreciation to Amherst Media for working with us to bring our meetings into residents' homes and to our residents who challenge us every day to find a path forward when in many instances, we do not always agree. Next slide. Your town council consists of 13 talented individuals who are very hardworking and independently minded. Councilors serve as chairs and vice chairs of, and as members of our four standing committees where some of the really hard work gets done. Our three at-large town councilors are Mandy Jo Haneke, Andy Steinberg, and Alicia Walker. And for once in reverse order, I'm going to start with district five. Anna Devlin Gothier, Gothier, who also serves as vice president of the council, and Chalini Balmilm. District four, the representatives are Nika Lopes and Pam Rooney. District three is represented by Dorothy Pam, Jennifer Taub. Pat, Pat DeAngelis joins me in representing district two, and Michelle Miller and Kathy Shane represent district one. Now more than ever, each brings an important set of values and perspectives much needed in the town. 
Each counselor strives to represent those they serve. Please, at some moment, please let your counselor know how you appreciate them in the same way that you let them know about issues that are important to you. Next slide. Throughout our four years, we actually have continued to fulfill the requirements of the charter. It's our guiding, it's our guidebook. Uh, and we continue to make, make notes. In fact, one of the notes you'll find in the charter is that every year ending in four, we actually do a review of the charter. That's coming up in 2024. Our job based on the charter includes public forums, district meetings, at least two a year in every district, and of course, town council and committee meetings. Councilors work actively as the four members of the standing committees, the Joint Capital Planning Committee, and we have added to that list the Elementary School Building Committee and the Jones Library Building Committee. Individual councilors are also liaisons to selected town committees and available to all residents. There's also, next slide, please. There's also charter requirements, and this is just a reminder of what we have accomplished over these last several years. First of all was the approval of the master plan as recommended by the planning board. We file legislation allowing us, we have filed legislation allowing us to implement ranked choice voting. And I've been informed by Representative Dom that we do not have to refile or revote that legislation. It will automatically be refiled. We receive reports, we received a report from the Tory Budgeting Commission and actually have found other ways for residents to make budget requests through CPA, resident capital, capital requests, and speaking out at public forums and public comment. And we have did develop and adopted a redistricting plan that was developed by our very able districting advisory committee. New district lines were reassigned and we used them in just this past fall's election. Some of you may not have vote, noticed because you did early voting at town hall or you voted by mail. But just so you know, you may wanna check where you actually have to show up for the election um, if you want to show up in person. The, the new district lines will apply to the spring 2023 elementary school debt exclusion vote. And this fall in 2023, you will elect town councilors, school committee members, and Jones Library. And the town councilors will be by 10 of them by the districts they live in. Next slide. Counselors are regularly in contact with, with residents through email, phone, Facebook, newsletters, meetings, all kinds of places. We regularly read proclamations at public events. We sponsor support and support legislation and we attend meetings of other organizations. Next slide. Our work is guided by the charter, our rules of procedure, our standing committees as they discuss items. And we, in fact, in our very beginning years, did create the Board of Licensed Commissioners but can, and continue to appoint people to the Planning Board and Zoning Board of Appeals. Next slide. And one of the things we do every year when we have an election is make sure that we ensure your voting rights. Next slide. Our accomplishments over the four years are numerous, but I will focus on the past year. These are pre presented in categories identical to the town manager's policy goals because we can only accomplish these goals, which are our priorities, if we work together. First is climate action. Long ago, it seems like at least four years ago, we did create the Energy and Climate Action Committee and they put together an outstanding climate action set of goals and also brought to us the CARP, Climate Action Goals and Climate Action Adaptation and Resilience Plan. We have engaged in community choice aggregation and upon completion of the plan being submitted to the state, we hope it will be approved. Earlier this fall, we got to stand at the landfill and after 10 years of working hard on it, we got to cut the ribbon of the solar landfill project. 
which supplies somewhere between 40 and 50% of the town's energy needs. We asked the town manager to create the solar bylaw working group and conduct a solar siting study. And in addition, the town services and outreach committee is now looking at the feasibility of town managed hauling for trash, recycling and composting. We have been most fortunate to have outstanding town leadership in managing the COVID-19 pandemic, coupled with amazing work from our Department of Health and many volunteers. We continue to offer vaccinations in multiple locations. Upon recommendation of the Community Safety Working Group, we created CRESS that, and were able to swear yet another member of the CRESS team in tonight. We are close to adopting water and sewer bylaws and regulations. That will be, we hope, in early January or in January. And tonight we hope to complete a decade long flood mapping project with the approval of several motions and bylaws. TSR, TSO still has on its docket speed limits and street lighting. Recovering from the pandemic continues to take significant efforts and determination, including zoning bylaws and use of the public way. Next slide. This includes the town's partnership with the Bidden Chamber and our human service nonprofits, such as Family Outreach, Survival Center, and Craig Stores. We've invested in recreation and our public ways and done that by increasing their use, renovation, and additions. Next slide. We have passed several zoning laws, bylaws, and general bylaws in support of economic vitality and overall community welfare, including taking what was learned through temporary bylaw 14 and amending existing bylaws accordingly. That we hope will also be approved tonight. Other bylaws address housing, parking, surveillance technology, and historic preservation. Next slide. This is capital investments is an area of major activity for the town. You just have to ask the people who work on both the Jones Library Committee and the Elementary School Building Committee. We will learn more about that later. Locating a home for the Department of Public Works and the fire and EMS station south of downtown remain high on our list. And at the same time, we're benefiting from anonymous donations allowing for the expansion of the North Amherst Library and other donations that allowed us to build a dog park. Our capital inventory and five-year capital improvement plan is comprehensive, but daunting. We continue, the next slide. We continue to do this because of sound, outstanding fiscal management, a balanced budget, sufficient reserves, creation of a capital stabilization fund, clean audits, and an A++ bond rating. None of this should be taken lightly or assumed to be normal. With our outstanding fiscal staff and town management, we have worked hard to get there. Next slide. The work of the town council regarding housing is guided by our comprehensive housing policy that came from our CRC committee with long hours of work. In the area of affordable housing, we continue to work on 132 Northampton Road. As you bump along the bumpy parts of Route 9, you can see the three-story structure. And we have added to that Belchertown Road and the East Street Schools. A new development on Ball Lane is under review and will provide home ownership opportunities for low and moderate income families and individuals. We continue to provide for our homeless popula population while taking a major step forward with the pending purchase of 457 Main Street as a starting point for creating a permanent shelter and housing. The rental registration bylaw is under review by CRC and the town council has asked the finance committee to take a look at potential home rule legislation regarding implementation of a transfer fee related to the sale of homes above a certain dollar threshold. Um, next slide. Racial equity and social justice is an area of significant strides 
with many more miles to travel. We have approved a new department for diversity, equity, inclusion, and hired an outstanding director. The African Heritage Reparation Assembly continues to work on its recommendations while we continue to con contribute to the reparations fund. And I have been asked to make note that they will ha also have a listening session that will be virtual in January. The Community Safety and Social Justice Committee continues to its work and advocacy for the recommendations of the CSWG. And work has begun regarding the charge and description for a potential resident oversight board. Finally, we go to the last slide. Um, our future includes our ongoing six goals. We're still firming those up as we move into 2023. We continue to pass responsible capital and operating budgets. We absolutely hope that we will get to implement ranked choice voting in this next year, but that is up to the legislature. And counselors and the public, we all have a responsibility to make the job more manageable and shorten council meetings, provide additional transparency and additional resident engagement. Finally, as I've done in the past, um, I just wanna share some observations. The charter continues to be an outstanding document, often providing guidance in even the most obscure issues. We value the many ways in which we hear from our residents and ask that you continue to tell us when something is wrong and when something is right. Being president of the council means balancing one's democratic ideals with the need for leadership. The council keeps me in line, but most important to remember is we are all elected. We stand as equals. Leadership means hearing everyone and seeking solutions that may be tested and amended along the way. I'm honored to be president of the council, but I'm clear that I serve in this capacity at the pleasure of the council. Please let your counselors know that you appreciate them and recognize the dedication they each bring to this important role in our community. We're not going to just pause for a moment while I introduce Paul Bachman, uh, who is going to give the next phase of the State of the Town. Paul has been town manager of Amherst since 2016. Prior to becoming the chief executive officer of the town of Amherst, Paul was director of administration and finance at the Mass Municipal Association, the statewide association of all cities and towns in Massachusetts. He also served as the town administrator in the town of Ma Manchester by the sea for 13 years. Paul has also worked for the city of Cambridge Historical Commission and was elected himself to the school committee in Somerville, winning elections six times. Paul's a graduate of Hampshire College and has a master's degree in city planning from MIT. Paul, your turn. Thank you, Lynn. Good slides. And thank you for posting this. Um, go to the next one. That's me. Let me go to the next one. <laughs> Let's get off that. Oh, well. Okay. Um, so I have the wonderful privilege to walk into this magnificent building, the town hall every day um, when I come to work. Uh, it was built in 1889. You can see the year inscribed on the top step as you enter the building. It was controversial to build. This is Amherst, as you know, and it took a fire to get the town to actually build it. But in building it, the town projected a sense of optimism, stability, and durability. They built it with brick and granite. They were constructing a building, the largest in town for the long haul. Town leaders had an eye toward the future. Building this building wasn't an easy task. It took fortitude and an optimistic vision of where the town was going. I think about this because I wonder if the people who built this building could ever imagine the work that goes on here every day. I'm sure they never imagined that we'd be spending most of our time in front of screens or that we would be conducting our meetings in, on screens. Um, but I bet that many of our debates about what to build and how, and how to build it would sound pretty familiar to them. It's no secret that it's hard to get things done in local government. It's government that is closest to the people. We all have opinions and we all care. 
it's not unusual for a project to take several years to actually design and build something, but that's actually the easy part. Usually there were several years before that spent developing finance plans, convincing boards, committees, and the voters that these projects are needed for their children and their children's children, and that the money was going to be spent wisely. It's especially true in Amherst, but I have to say, the town where only the H is silent takes debate to a nearly uh, nearly every issue to a new level. We see it play out in the town council meetings weekly, it seems. Through the course of these debates, I strive to be positive. I tell myself that the debate is part of the process that we have to go through to get to a better place to actually get things done. But it can be frustrating at times. I know you all feel this too, and I know the public feels it as well. One of our challenges is how to maintain the kind of optimism it took to build this building and to retain the fortitude and confidence it takes to move the community forward, even in the face of criticism. So I feel like we've missed a couple slides, but maybe not. Is that the second slide? Okay. Um, so what does this mean for how we are doing? Given that this is the state of the town, I can attest and state with conviction that the state of the town is strong and resilient. We are strong because we have solid finances and engaged leaders and staff ready to make informed decisions and to do the work. We are resilient because as we emerge from the depths of the pandemic, we can show dozens of achievements and can show plans for more in the coming years. To that end, I wanna celebrate our accomplishments for the past year and speak with hopefulness of where we will make progress in 2023. So let's look at our record of accomplishments and I won't, I'll skip over anything that Lynn has already talked about. Um, as I look back at the past year or so, we've had many successes and some truly amazing things that we can celebrate. So think about it and go to the next slide. Maybe it's this, Here, no, no, that one, yeah. Our kids now have a new spray park at Goth Park and a new playground at Kendrick Park. The town now owns 150 acres of pristine land the former Hickory Ridge Golf Course, purchased for just $520,000 that preserves over a mile of sensitive river frontage and sets aside land to generate 6.5 megawatts of electricity using solar panels. To the east on Belchertown Road, we powered up the new solar project on the town's closed landfill, generating another four megawatts of clean energy, all of it going to meet the needs of our municipal buildings. And a side benefit to this project was that dedicated residents and staff were able to find the space and, and funds to open our first dog park on another part of the closed landfill. And due to the generosity of a private donor, we were making progress on a sweet addition to our iconic North Amherst Library, which coincidentally was built just a few years after this town hall was built. These are all tangible things we can look at and appreciate. We did them together as a community. While some have had a smoother path, others have taken close to a decade to become a reality. All have required extensive review by committees and thousands of hours of staff time to bring them to completion. Next slide, maybe? Yes. Um, in, in this past year, we created two new departments. Now, now, creating new departments is not something that gets done very often. There isn't a playbook for how to do it. It's been decades, in fact. I think the last time a public safety department was created, we were figuring out how many teams of horses should pull a fire apparatus. But now, responding to one of the town council's main goals, we have Department of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, which we call DEI, led by Director Pamela Nolan Ryan. Pamela Ryan Nolan, sorry. And a department of, I just call her Pamela, uh, and a Department of Community Responders for Equity, Safety, and Service led by Director Miller Earl, uh, Earl Miller. <laughs> I'm so pleased that we have the right leaders in place to create these new departments. True to Amherst independent spirit, Crest is using a model that has only been tried by a handful of small communities nas nationally. Police Chief Livingstone and Fire Chief Nelson have been extraordinary in collaborating to support the development of this department. But every day brings a new challenge. I talked with Earl this morning, we had something new to talk about. I ask you and every member of the public to keep in mind, change in local government takes time. Expect years of work to fully realize the goals of our DEI and Crest departments, but the work will be done. In, in addition, we're making tangible progress on other major goals set by the town council. Next slide. We're working relentlessly to get a new elementary school for our children, which will create operational savings by combining two schools into one. 
This spring, the voters will be asked to support a new building by voting to exclude its debt from the limits of Proposition 2.5. It is vital for the town's future that this debt exclusion pass. Tonight, you'll get a brief glimpse of this new building that I hope you'll be as excited as we are for what the future holds. Plans for the Jones Library renovations are coming into focus. That building needs a serious injection of capital, most of which has been secured by a grant or will be raised privately to become a true centerpiece of our community and the downtown business district. It's a bold statement, much like the town hall was in 1889, that will pay dividends well into the future. We have continued, continued to make real progress on securing new facilities for our firefighters and public works employees. The current central fire station and DPW facility must be addressed. Expect to see solid steps on these two projects early in 2023. So next slide. I'm going to zip through some of our other accomplishments. I'm not going to read all these words. Uh, the town is used, as Lynn said, the town is using our CARP, their Climate Action Adaptation and Resiliency Plan as our guide, um, and including $500,000 in ARPA funds to, to move some of these um, initiatives forward. Next slide. With the affordable housing projects on North, Northampton Road, Belchertown Road, and the East Street School, we will rank among the top towns in providing affordable housing by percentage of housing. And we are preparing to purchase the former site of the VFW on Main Street as a location for a permanent year-round homeless shelter. Next slide. Our health department has continued to address the needs of the public by offering testing, contact tracing, and vaccination clinics to fight COVID-19. In the last couple of weeks, nearly 600 people received their vaccine, many for the first time, and also working with the DPW, the health department was select, selected by the state to conduct regular testing of our wastewater for COVID. This information is shared regularly on our town website. Next slide. The shakeout from the pandemic has certainly taken a toll on our local businesses, but ac actually economic activity in town is pretty good, especially when you compare it to other communities. The town has been awarded hundreds of thousands of dollars in grants for downtown improvements, and there's more to come. I want to recognize the energy and tireless creativity of the leaders of the Business Improvement District and the Chamber. Working with town planning staff, their vision and energy have truly changed the game in Amherst. We all recognize the university and colleges are part of our community's cultural richness and vitality. We will continue to work with them to ensure that they become full partners in our community. We appreciate their openness to these discussions and hope to report to the town council in the very near future. Construction has started on the Pomeroy Village Roundabout, funded in large part by $1.5 million state grant. A similar grant was awarded for improvements to the East Amherst Village Center for sidewalk improvements on Belcherton Road. The long and way to improve improvements to the North Common, again funded with the aid of a sizable federal grant, is on tap for, early, for 2023. As our improvements to the South Common, um, which was awarded a $250,000 grant. So with everything I've just mentioned, nothing, absolutely none of it would be accomplished if we didn't have our financial house in order. Try next slide. We are so very fortunate to have finance staff who have always centered our aspirations with the financial realities of what we can afford. Comptroller Sonia Aldrich has announced her retirement in 2023. She is, she is leaving us in a good place. The town's finances are secure, strong, and above reproach. Detailed understanding of the town's finances has enabled town staff to insist, anticipate needs, budget for contingent, contingencies, and ensure the town will always be able to meet its obligations. We have maintained our commitment to build reserves and reduce our debt obligations. Our evolving five-year capital plan sets a new standard for setting realistic expectations for future capital commitments. Next slide. And then we go to the next slide. So I have worked in local government my entire career. When working in local government, one must take stock of our accomplishments. And that's what I just did, because we need to remember that our work will lead to a better tomorrow. We need to identify and celebrate these accomplishments to bolster our resiliency because things can take a long time. You see, it's the rare initiative that doesn't have a, at least one group of individuals who doesn't like it. We hear it every day. The effort to advance an idea or project can take years. We find ourselves trying to convince, cajole, and even grovel to get a project over the finish line. As one of my colleagues in local government reminds me, it is the frustrations and setbacks that we typically remember, 
We focus on the delays, diversions, and recriminations. I have to remind myself to recognize the many accomplishments of which we can all be rightly proud. For those in the community who say we aren't going far enough or fast enough, I challenge you to point to another community that is doing more, another community that is having these dynamic discussions about race and climate, another group that is engaged in deep reflection about public engagement. Other municipal other municipal staff who see their work for the town as their mission, not just a job. Another police department that serves the town as well as, as ours does. Another public school system where you would rather send your children. We aren't perfect, I, I recognize that, but we are engaged and willing to do the work to make our community better. Lastly, I wanna acknowledge that it's been a rough year for our employees. Like every entity, we have had staffing challenges, but the town's employees have really stepped up to fill shifts, answer phones, fill in when needed. Every time you ask an employee to do something, they're, they're, they're there and they always are filling in gaps when they, when they recognize it. I really feel honored to work alongside these dedicated people who continue to devote their professional careers to serving the people of Amherst. I especially want to acknowledge the town's department heads. I, these are the folks that you most interact with. Um, they're very talented individuals and I appreciate every one, every, appreciate every one of our staff there's no shortage of goals. Tonight, the town council will be discussing several dozen goals for the manager in 2023, which I look forward to, to engaging in. Um, but it, the me central message for me tonight is we will need resilience, patience, and persistence, and drawing on our better selves to realize our goals. Keeping the long-term plan an explicit part of the daily conversation makes short-term setbacks easier to take, which takes me back to this building. In 1889, town leaders set a path to build a majestic town hall in the center of town. Because we're sitting here tonight, we're fortunate they had the vision and courage to build it. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, I would just want to note that in addition to being joined by Sharon Sherry, who is the director of the Jones Library, we do have trustees from both the library and the school in the audience as well. Sharon is a Berkshire County native and a UMass alum. She's been working in Western Mass Public Libraries for 30 years. She's been the director of the Jones Library System for the past 11 years. And prior to coming to Amherst, she directed both the Greenfield and Sunderland Public Libraries. Sharon, I just also wanna mention that there is a larger, longer report in the packet to the public and the council. Um, but Sharon is going to highlight some of that in her brief presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lynn. And thank you all councilors and, and uh, town manager Balkelman. Do um, you want to pull up the slides? Thank you. Next slide. So the COVID pandemic continued to affect all library activity throughout fiscal year 22. Over the summer of 21, staff continued to act as greeters to ensure that patrons were wearing masks and remaining socially distant. And the open hour schedules for the three buildings remained limited. But as of Labor Day 2021, for the first time since March 2020, all three library buildings opened full time. I want to give a special shout out uh, to the Amherst Health Department for working with us throughout the year to distribute, P distribute PCR COVID tests to the public on a weekly basis. Uh, the public demand for those kits uh, was quite extraordinary during that time. And to the Amherst Fire Department for continuing to provide library staff with KN95 masks even after the mask mandate was lifted in March. The library system uh, has yet to return to pre-COVID operations. People are still quite wary of COVID. So during FY22, staff continued pivoting with many of our services and programs being made available either virtually or outside. The Children's Department hosted 99 virtual programs in FY22, including the distribution over eight, of over 1,800 take-and-make activity crafts. The reference department began up offering library patrons up to 10 pages of free printing or copying each day. 
We also continued our free print from home service, which patrons used over 300 times during FY22. Striving to make the branches more action-oriented spaces, the Munson Memorial and the North Amherst Libraries also provided take-and-make activity crafts. On a beautiful day in October of 21, the ESL department hosted a naturalization oath ceremony outside under the tent. The teens released a collaborative Tales and Tales, that's T-A-I-L-S and T-A-L-E-S, zine, which included submissions from kids and teens and adults throughout, from, throughout the community. Continuing our collaboration begun the previous year with the Amherst Survival Center, two virtual programs were bought to the Survival Center community, as well as to the wider Amherst community. A free cooking class featured the center's community meals coordinator preparing a meal made from local seasonal produce. And then later, a free virtual class offering an introduction to modern calligraphy was offered with materials available for pickup by participants at both the Jones Library and the Survival Center. In April, which is National Poetry Month, our special collections staff gave a completely verbal presentation about Emily Dickinson and Amherst during her lifetime, along with descriptions of our collections for Behind Our Eyes, which is an organization of writers with disabilities. Part of the presentation was a verbal walk with Lavinia up Main Street from the Homestead to Cutler's store on Merchant's Row. Our homebound program also grew in popularity, with staff and volunteers providing access to library materials to Amherst residents who were unable to visit the library in person. The trustees and staff continue to build, to build upon previous diversity efforts to ensure that racial equity is a, a priority. Thanks to funding from the Friends of the Library, staff created the library's traveling book cart. And this cart was filled with youth and adult uh, black literature and taken to the Juneteenth celebration on the common. Anyone could borrow a book and no library card was required. Our 2022 on the same page Amherst program was held virtually again. The selected title was Gerald Walker's How to Make a Slave and Other Essays with supporting programs and a book discussion, over 100 participants delved into Walker's Reflections of Race by a Black man in academia, of parenting, and as part of the wider community. Staff also increased the number of programs held off-site, which helped provide greater access to said programs. For example, of the 178 programs that the Jones Library Kids Department hosted, 44% of them were hosted outside the library, either under the tent or off-site in the community. A couple of off-site programs included our Winter Solstice Storytime at Kendrick Park and the Flying High Dogs at Roth Park. Next slide. Let me give you, let me switch gears and give you a quick overview of our budget. Regarding income, the library received a 2.1% increase in its town appropriation for FY22. The trustees reduced the endowment draw rate to 4%, uh, which was down from 4.5% in FY21. This equaled a 7% decrease in income. So in order to fill the gap, the Friends of the Jones Library System donated over $160,000 to the library, and which was a 16% increase over FY21. Gifts from the Friends equaled 7.7% .7 of the library's FY22 total operating budget. And I wanna thank all of our donors, uh, small gifts, large gifts, they all matter and they all, um, help to provide uh, programs and services that really make a difference in our town. Library staff also secured $23,000 worth of grant funding for the purchase of circulating materials, special collections programming, and equity training for staff. Regarding expenses, 65% of the library's uh, total operating budget during FY22 was spent on personnel. Utilities expenses, which equaled 3.6% of the operating budget, saw a 31% increase. And building maintenance costs increased by 8%, basically because the Jones systems have exceeded their useful lives. 
Based on demand for the second year in a row, the purchase of e-content surpassed that of books. There are many reasons for this nationwide decline of print book usage. For example, our Google machines, they have definitely contributed to the decline. Using our personal devices is convenient and enjoyable for a lot of us. Budget cuts. Public libraries have not recovered from the 08 recession. We are weeding according to industry standards, slowly and methodically, but we're unable to replace these items as quickly because there just isn't enough money. So there are fewer books on the shelves available for checkout. And also technology is changing at the speed of light. And so because of this, libraries are also having to pur purchase the same title in many different formats, whether it's regular print or large print, a book on CD, a play away, and that eats up the budget quickly. Next slide. And finally, an update on the building project. As you know, the Jones Building is in need of extensive work to solve its safety, efficiency, and building systems problems. These problems cannot be solved by rearranging the furniture. You combine these issues with the fact that we're unable to serve this community's underserved. At a cost of $15.8 million to the town, regardless of what the total project cost is, the trustees in the town are moving forward with our Massachusetts Public Library Construction Grant Project. In advancement of the renovation and expansion project, several key milestones were met during FY22. The Jones Library Building's Historic Structure Report was completed. The Amherst Historical Commission unanimously approved moving the Kinsey Garden plantings and hardscapes to the Kestrel Land Trust property located in South Amherst. The Jones Library Building's historic preservation restriction was completed. Due to their historical significance, a separate and permanent room for the town's Civil War tablets was designed. Also, many opportunities for public engagement were provided throughout the fiscal year, including an appearance on Cup of Joe with the town manager, a library chat, building committee, community chats, and an open house was held in May in order to speak with community members and collect comments about the project. And finally, the town received its first MBLC construction grant disbursement in the amount of $2,774,263. If you have not yet had an insider's tour of the Jones, I urge you to set aside one hour, maybe an hour and a half for a tour. And if you'd like to make a pledge towards the capital campaign, I would love to hear from you as well. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. We really appreciate you being with us. Um, we're going to go on to the school committee, and we're joined tonight by Allison McDonald, who is chair of the school committee. Uh, Allison and her family moved to Amherst 20 years ago, choosing Amherst for the strong reputation of its public schools. She's a communications and marketing professional, has worked locally and now virtually. Over the years, she has volunteered with the PGO at Fort River and helped out with her son's youth sports events. After serving on the district's enrollment working group in 2017, Allison was elected to the school committee in 2018. She is now the chair of that school committee and is the past chair of the regional school committee. Allison, we'll put your slides up and you may want to go ahead and mention that Doreen Cunningham has joined us this evening uh, and Mike Morris is unable to be with us. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, I see, I can see Doreen's face on the screen. Um, so uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm Allison McDonald um, and have been um, with the school committee for almost five years now. Um, and uh, Doreen Cunningham is here uh, with us. She's our assistant superintendent for diversity, equity, and HR. Um, and so I'm happy that she's able to join us tonight. Um, I'm not sure I see my colleagues in attendance, but I'm sh sure they're watching from home. There are many, many, many other individuals who work very hard every day in support of our students and our schools who are not here. Um, but we are both fortunate and grateful for their efforts and um, dedication. So next slide. 
I, I, I show this slide every year, but I think it's super important because um, I think you know, we, it's easy to, um, to to forget what our what our overarching mission and our guiding star is um, for our schools. It is obviously our students. We all know that. Um, but I think um, it's helpful to just ground ourselves every year in this. Um, our mission is to provide all of our students with a high quality education to enable them to be contributing members of a multi-ethnic, multicultural, pluralistic society. And we seek to create an environment in our schools that achieves equity for all students and ensures that each student is a successful learner, is fully respected, and learns to respect others. Next slide. I'm going to talk both about our elementary schools and um, as represent as an Amherst representative on the regional school committee, I'll talk a little bit about our regional schools because our children in, in Amherst attend both of those school systems. Um, we have three elementary schools um, uh, that serve nearly a thousand students in grades kindergarten through sixth grade. An additional 60 students are served in our early childhood center at, at Crocker Farm. Our three schools, Wildwood, Port River, and Crocker Farm are roughly similar in size and demographics with a student population that's highly diverse. More than half of our students are um, Black, Indigenous, or other people of color, and more than one in four speak a language that's a first language that is not English. Additionally, more than half of our students are high needs as defined by the State Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, or DESE. 37% are low income and more than one in five have disabilities. A budget of 28.8 million in spending this year, including funding from federal, state and other grants enables us to deliver on our mission to support the needs and learning journey of every one of our students. Next. We enjoy a strong statewide reputation for our public schools and, and it's a legacy that our community values and prioritizes. Our elementary school district consistently meets state progress and accountability goals, though persistent gaps remain among high needs, high needs students and other groups. To address these persistent gap gaps, particularly in math, we implemented a new math curriculum this year after an extensive review and pilot last year. This curriculum, um, there's more at the end of these slides, there's links to more, a lot more information, including a presentation about the selection process and a little bit more about this math curriculum. Um, our Commonantes dual language program is based in the Port River School and it's now in its fourth year. Um, it's now encompasses uh, kindergarten through third grade. Each year we add, add, a, add, add a grade um, at the top. The education program in our schools is enhanced through art, music, both classroom and instrumental music uh, instruction, PE, library and media studies, and tech technology education. That is, um, each of these is provided in weekly specials classes, as well as integrated into grade level unit studies. We also have an innovative school garden program that continues and it's integrated into our science curriculum at the elementary schools. We continue to offer low class average size, um, sorry, average class sizes of about 18 um, to promote learning and a low student teacher ratio of nine to one. Next slide. While the budget for elementary schools has grown over the years, the increase in costs, such as for transportation, staff salaries and benefits have grown faster than the funding we receive. This year, we're using approximately $400,000 of, of one-time federal grants to avoid cuts and to restore full-time art and technology teachers at each of our schools. Um, as mentioned, $25 million of that funding is coming from the town of Amherst, and $3.2 million is coming from funding from federal grants as well as other restricted money from revolving funds. Next slide. Looking at our regional schools, we have two regional schools that serve about 1,200 students in grades 7 through 12 from the four towns of Amherst, Pelham, Leverett, and Shutesbury. Sorry, I lost my notes. There we go. Um, Amherst is uh, this. Our student population in the schools is also very diverse, um, with half of our students being Black, Indigenous, or pe other people of color. More than 40% of our students are high needs in our regional schools, and one in three are low income. More than one in five have, students have disabilities. 
our budget our budget of $37.8 million enables us to deliver on our mission and support the needs of each of these students. Next. Like our elementary schools, our regional schools enjoy an excellent reputation thanks to our dedicated and high quality educators, staff, and administrators. Students at both the middle and the high school are offered an array of electives. At the high school, our core academic program includes diverse offering of AP and other advanced courses. Two thirds of our 11th and 12th graders complete advanced courses each year, and 80% of all ARHS students take courses in the arts, um, uh, which is a reflection of the diversity and popularity of these offerings. This is pretty um, unusual and unique uh, for our area. There's um, in the full report that's attached to the packet, you'll see comparison um, on a lot of these statistics with some of our um, neighboring high schools. Our schools provide strong community and school programs to support student well being and social emotional health, including our family center that operates district wide. It's based in the middle school, but it operates for our entire um, elementary regional district. Our Bright program, um, and I'm forgetting what that stands for, but it's a support for um, mental health and um, students at, uh, after extended ab absences from school, um, and our restorative justice programs. Additionally, after piloting later start times during the pandemic, we implemented that as a permanent change last year and continue this year. Um, a survey of uh, students and staff and, and families um, earlier uh, in the year uh, demonstrated that this uh, change is still um, uh, preferred by a majority of our community. Um, and that's to help support um, in the learning and emotional health of our students. We prioritize smaller class sizes to promote learning, and our schools provide high quality in district special ed programs for intensive special needs students. There's a wide array of clubs and sports. Nearly a third of our students participate in, in athletics, and together these, these opportunities define the rich character of our regional schools. Next slide. After three years of flat funding that required cumulative cuts of nearly $2 million to the services that we had provided in 2019-20, this year's budget, we were able to maintain services similar to our elementary schools, thanks in part to the one-time federal funding that we have in grants. Um, this year, uh, we're using $17 million in um, funding from the town of Amherst, an additional 16, approximately $16 million in funding it comes from the state and other, the three other region towns, and $4 million in funding from federal and other grants, as well as revolving funds. Next. This slide uh, shows our uh, goals for this year. Um, these include the school building project. Um, so continue to collaborate with the elementary school building committee to help advance that project. Um, we also are moving our sixth grade um, uh, to the middle school. Amherst is the only town in the region that is moving at sixth grade, and those students will remain students of the elementary school district. Um, we're completing those plans, um, and that will happen at the fall of next year. Budget engagement, we're um, implementing new ways to engage the community in the budget development. The regional school committee recently um, completed a survey of, of our uh, school community that provided uh, rich, rich feedback from over 200 respondents, um, lots of open-ended comments, much more than we typically get in our, in our budget hearings and budget forums. And the elementary school committee is going to um, uh, implement something similar in the new year. Um, the regional capital, capital plan, looking to develop and refine our long-term capital plan um, for the regional um, uh, properties. We're also focusing on student safety and well being, particularly in the regional schools, um, and staff diversity and inclusion. This is, an, uh, this is um, a goal that we've had sort of over multiple, multiple years um, that uh, Doreen Cunningham has been leading a lot of this effort um, in supporting uh, professional development for and to increase the retention of staff of color. Um, I, I hope uh, you'll tune in for and, and look in the in the full report to see the progress that we've made. It is significant to see the changes over the four or five years since um, since this has been a, a, a fo focused goal. Um, in terms of curriculum instruction, we're going to continue to implement work on implementation of the new elementary math curriculum and focus on monitoring student achievement data to make sure it's achieving um, that it's having the impact that we had intended. 
Um, and at the region, we're working on school improvement plans to, uh, to update those school improvement plans. Next. This slide um, has links to a lot more information. Um, there's also in the packet, there's many more slides that have um, a lot more information about the schools. Um, if you want to look at more information about the plan for the sixth grade move to the middle school, the elementary math curriculum, the community feedback on the start time change, as well as community feedback on the regional schools budget. Um, if you have questions, please, um, not tonight, um, but use, uh, you can email the school committee at amherstschoolcommittee at arps.org um, at any time after this. Um, Dr. Morris's email is there. Um, and um, Doreen Cunningham's email is also on the, um, um, on the website. And I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Um, we're going to move on to a special feature of tonight where Kathy Shane, who is chair of the elementary school building committee, uh, she also serves on other committees for the council uh, and has served on the council since its, since its beginning four years ago. She and her family have lived in Amherst for 40 years, trained as an economist with a focus on public finance before retiring, Kathy led policy and research efforts to reform the US healthcare. She also served at, for a decade as the research and policy director for a national labor union representing low-wage health and other service workers. Kathy, please proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. I'm if, uh, wait to get my slides up. I'm both delighted and honored to have this opportunity to share the emerging design of the new elementary school and I'm doing this on behalf of our fabulous school building committee, which has um, at least one other counselor, Alicia Walker on it and multiple school members. All of the pictures that I'm showing tonight come from presentations to the committee by our creative responsible design team, Danisco Design. Next slide. With the sixth grade moving to the middle school, the proposed new school will serve 575 students, grades kindergarten through fifth grade, consolidating Wildwood and Fort River into one school located at the current Fort River site. As you can see from this overview of the site layout, the site is large enough to allow a new building on the south end of the property a substantial distance away from the current school, which is that little dotted line you see up top, it allows for a safe construction site while the school is in session. Not yet, please go back. Thank you. Um, the outdoor site plan for the school includes locations for play and outdoor learning, including areas for student projects and rain gardens for water runoffs. Outdoor learning was a top priority of the community and staff when we listened during the spring forums. Recreational playing fields to the north side of the new school will be well-drained and available during and after school for multiple recreational sports. As illustrated, the site again is large enough to allow buses and cars to circulate without crossing over with safe pathways for walkers and bicyclists. Next slide. The new three-fourth floor school will have classroom and spaces that meet educational needs with a flexible design and areas for small group activities. Students will learn and teachers will uh, be in the classrooms that are daylight filled with space throughout. The school home will be home for the dual language program that Allison just mentioned and special needs programs. These are well integrated into the floor lights, layouts. The design includes a cafetorium and a gym that will be available after hours to the community with secure access. One of the most exciting features of the school, in addition to the fabulous design, will it will be Amherst's first public net zero building, an exciting milestone, including geothermal wells and all electric HVAC system, HVAC system will be in a well-insulated energy efficient building, solar panels for renewable renewable energy will offset electric costs. Based on our building plans, new incentives for Eversource will provide an estimated 1.6 million, including support of construction. 
after it opens, the school will save at least $250,000 a year on utility costs. I think what particularly exciting is that the building will provide a place for our children and future children to learn and participate in climate action. Next slide. I'm at, at, as this video shows you, the design team has been able to bring the building to life for us. As we approach the entrance, you can see it's clearly marked. There's a place for the name of the school, and we've actually thought we might want to have a naming contest if we decide to name it differently. On the north side, which is the side we're looking at now, the cafeteria and the library above it will be facing the playing fields with windows that allow light to come in both to the room and to the internal areas. You're seeing playing fields that I discussed illustrated. The orange overhang is the kindergarten, which is, has a larger space. There'll be two classrooms per floor in the three floors with the fourth and fifth graders getting the privileged position of being on the top floor, um, on the top of everyone else. As we rotate around to the other side of the building, which is the south side, there's space for children's science projects and children's gardens. The teachers who participate in thinking about the outdoor learning. There's also going to be an area with rain gardens and bioswales with a lot of emphasis on the outdoor for outdoor learning. As we swing all the way around, you'll see a large white building protruding and that's the gym, which is on this south side. And it's designed in a way that when the buses come and loop into the building in the morning, they'll be able to, students will be able to go directly into the building or, or with van, van drop-offs. And I'm, you know, I can't speed up the video because I'm not in control of it. But as you come around, what you're going to see is the sloped roofs that you saw when you first were looking at the school are set up to be able to have the PV panels on top of the roof. And there will also be PV panels over the, um, the parking area. So this net zero design is both very in energy efficient and has led to a design that allows light to come into the building. Next slide. Uh, we're somehow we're still on the okay that's great this slide again is as if we're walking into the building um Danisco has allowed us to see what some of the floor layouts look like and what the height of the ceiling looks like as well as the glass daylight has been emphasized throughout this building both internal and allowing light to come into the hallways. And those colored tiles you see up on top are acoustical tiles to keep the noise levels down. As we rotate around walking down this hallway, you're going to see the cafeteria on the left. And um, I thought I had sped up the time. I'm sorry, Lynn. We're just walking very slowly down this hallway. <laughs> but one of the, the things that the designers have looked at is that is a piece of wall that if we wanna do community art, including reproduce, what you can see on the outside of Fort River, this is a potential space for artwork to come inside the building. On your left, as we swing around, is gonna be the cafeteria. And on your right, you can see the gym. And both of these have light coming in with glass internal walls, as well as the ability to look outside. Um, now, last but not least, is the cafeteria. You can walk outside of this cafeteria to the outdoors. You can see the stage and it connects to the music rooms, which are on the entry of the building. So the music classes can come on to the stage for practice and or performances. I'm just gonna let the slide walk us back out of the building. Um, you can actually click out of this slide, Sean, we'll go into the next one. On this one, I took, whoops, you can back up to, on this one, I took snapshots. We have videos of the multiple internal spaces to give you a look at what the classrooms look like. These are very efficiently and flexibly designed and the teachers can choose where they want the wall boards. Behind that white space, there's storage capacity. And you can see again, this emphasis on light in the building. 
just outside the classroom, we can see in the upper corner are these project spaces, a very innovative part of this school design where you can go out with small classroom sizes, small groups of students, and it's clusters of classrooms with lockers surrounding. And then the top part of that is area storage for teachers and staff. These will be facing classes on one side, classes on the other with these outdoor areas with the two grades per floor actually able to store some of this, share some of this space and get cross-age learning. On the bottom corner, you see the inside of the library. The library has been designed so all of those stacks in the middle can move and you can recreate study spaces and reconfigure it as you need for the classes. Next slide. And all of these, by the way, are up. We can, we're making them available on our website and they are animated. This is the timeline we're looking at. Right now, we finished the major details on schematic design, the layout, the massing of the building, the tentative exterior materials, the layout of the site. And this is enough now to update our cost estimates and get revised cost estimates. We expect them back by the end of December. In January and February, the committee will be meeting both to discuss the cost estimates and then review the report that we need to um, approve and submit to MSBA, the Massachusetts School Building Authority, by March 1st. And this is the authority that will prov be providing grant support of the school. As Lynn already told you, there are two community forums scheduled, and we plan to get the news out on them. There'll be the same forum both, run both in the morning and then again in the evening with ample time for community discussion. The council will begin its discussion in January um, around the debt exclusion, starting to discuss uh, the, what we're being asked for in terms of language and voting, how we're going to vote, setting the voting date, Later on in March and April, the council will be asked for to come up with financing decisions and vote the debt exclusion, uh, vote the debt authorization. Amherst residents are going to vote, at least right now, we've scheduled it for May 2nd, which is after we hear and we know what the Amherst share will be. If all goes well, and I certainly hope it will, because the school is an amazingly exciting project, construction will begin on 2024 and the school will open on September 2026. And I just want to close with Paul said it's been a privilege to be our town manager. I've had such a privilege to be able to serve as chair of a fantastic committee for an exciting project that will be for children of the next few years, but I think it's going to be with us for generations to some come. It's a forward-looking building with an innovative and flexible design. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Um, I just want to conclude this by going back to an announcement, and that is on January 11th at 6.30 p.m., the African Heritage Reparations Assembly will hold a listening session that's virtual, and their special guest will be Congressman McGovern. With that, we're concluding the state of the town and we're going on to the regular business of the council. The next item up is in fact public comment and it is the only public comment this evening. Um, the one guest that has been with us in the audience has decided not to stay for public comment, but Tony, thank you for joining us. Um, if you are in the audience and that right now there are 16 people in the audience on Zoom, if you would like to make public comment, please raise your hand at this time. See no public comment. I'm going to move on to the consent agenda. And let me just note that we've added a couple things in the consent agenda, but I will explain them as we go along. As in the past, the following items were selected because they were not considered to be, they were considered to be routine, and it was reasonable to expect they would pass with no controversy. However, you can remove an item. And at some point during this discussion, I will ask if there's anybody who does not want to vote on the zoning items, which will require a two-thirds vote. 
So the motion that I'm going to start with, and then you'll tell me if you have any you'd like to remove is the following. To move the following items and the printed motions there under and approve those items as a single unit. 8A, proposed amendment to zoning bylaw article three, use regulations article five, accessory use article 11, administration and enforcement and article 12, definitions. I'm not going to read the definitions. They're on your screen, the uh, bullets on your screen. Um, article, I mean, I'm sorry, 8B, proposed revision to zoning bylaw, Article 2, zoning districts, Article 3, use regulations, and Article 16, FEMA floodplain overlay district zoning bylaw, official zoning map, FEMA fl floodplain overlay district, flood insurance rate maps firm and flood insurance study dated February 9, 2023. Um, and that also has some additional bullets that you'll see on the screen. 8C, adoption of revisions to general bylaw 3.22, discharging of firearms. All three of these, we had our first discussion of, of them last week. And this would be the second reading and vote. We have 8E, and in this case, it's a referral of the proposed surveillance use policy and surveillance technology impact report regarding the police department in cruiser video and audio to the town services and outreach committee. All this is, is a vote for a referral to the committee. There will still be an opportunity for a discussion later during the agenda. And finally is the um, 9A125, approval of town manager appointments to the Board of Health, the Human Rights Commission, Recreation Commission, Registrar of Voters, and Transportation Advisory Committee. Are there any items that people would like removed because you cannot vote for them? I am seeing none, so I am going to proceed with a vote. I'm going to start with- I think we need a second. I'll second the motion. I'm sorry, thank you. <laughs> um, the motion's been made and seconded. Uh, Shalini Bell Mill is absent. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmers, aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Annika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Pam Rooney. I'm sorry, Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Aye. It is unanimous, and we have also achieved a two thirds vote for those related to zoning. Uh, we have no proclamations this evening. And so we are going to go on to our first action item. I'm sorry, Pam, you have your hand up. Thank you. I just wanted to say thanks to the town staff for bringing those zoning uh, articles and all the hard work that it took to shape them and, and tie, up the, tie up the loose ends. Thank you. Thank you. I think we all join you in that appreciation. And we're giving them a slightly earlier evening since we're not going to talk anymore about them. So thanks. Uh, we are going to move on to the transfer of a portion of Hickory Ridge property on West Pomeroy Lane to the Recreation Commission and appropriation and transfer for acceptance of the park grant. I'm calling on uh, Town Manager Paul Bachman and Dave Zomack. Thank you, Lynn. There is a detailed memo in your packet, and I think Dave was going to address this. He's here. He is. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. Um, a little ahead of schedule, um, but happy to be here with you tonight. Yes, as Paul mentioned, there is a detailed memo and a map, uh, as well as a draft um, order in your packets. <clears throat> this is a um, a um, an action, uh, a series of actions that we have followed before when the town uh, applies for and receives park grant, um, park grants from the state, the state um, 
uh, grants those funds, but in uh, uh, typical state fashion, they would like us to do something in return. And that is um, they would like to dedicate a portion of the property to recreation, passive recreation. Uh, in this case, in your, uh, in, your, in your packet was a map of the acreage uh, that we're proposing uh, the trail go on. That is a, a Western portion, a small Western portion of the uh, property. Here it is, thank you, Athena. Um, and this is the area that we believe is the best location for an accessible trail. You can see in the lower right-hand corner of the map, uh, the current location of the old clubhouse parking lot and an outbuilding. And of course, we are going to stay uh, far clear of that because that is an area that is um, uh, the highest and driest on the property and is likely to be considered for other uses in the future. The area outlined in blue, uh, as I noted, is the area that we are proposing for this accessible trail. Um, part of the area, those portions in green, are actually already, um, they were formerly uh, cart paths. So they are either paved or crushed stone. The areas in yellow will be new uh, crushed stone um, walkways, about six or eight feet wide with appropriate uh, benches and kiosks, et cetera. So maybe I should stop there. Um, the funding for this, so the uh, order has two parts. Um, one part is, um, as I said, to dedicate the land to passive recreation. The other part is um, to really um, uh, um, authorize the use of uh, the two sources of funding. One is uh, previously authorized CPA funds, um, and then, of course, the grant. So there would be no need for new funds to support this uh, $400,000 project. Um, we think that um, as part of the um, redevelopment of, of Hickory Ridge, uh, trails and trail development, both north-south trails and uh, accessible trails are in keeping with some of the goals of the project. Um, so I think I'll stop there and happy to take your questions. Thank you, David. Kathy? <laughs> Yes, Dave, thank you for that. On the map, um, I was trying to figure out where the solar fields are going to go. So part of the what we did when we took this land is a part of the property has solar on it. And I wasn't quite sure where the trails intersect with that or whether they're completely to the right of the solar as I'm looking at the maps. Sure, if Athena could Just put that question. map, yeah, if Athena could put the map back up. That would be helpful. <clears throat> thank you, Athena. So um, the Western Array, so uh, thank you for your question, Kathy. It's actually quite timely because uh, my staff and I are in very active, I would call them nearing final um, completion stages with AMP Energy. Um, um, the building inspections office will be issuing a building permit for the solar in the weeks ahead and AMP intends to begin construction probably mid to late January. And in the upper left-hand corner of this slide, you can see the cross, cross hatch in blue. Thank you, Athena. That is the Western Array. Uh, for those of you in the audience, I know the council is well aware, um, there will be 26 acres of solar on the property. So the Western Array will be uh, where, where, where Athena's cursor was. The, a central or eastern array, yes, will be uh, approximately where uh, Athena, kind of in in the in the upper right hand corner of this slide. Yes, exactly, up in that area, there will be two nodes of solar connected by a crushed stone um, um, roadway, essentially. Um, so there's a, just to remind everyone, there's 150 acres, 26 acres of solar. Um, and there is a small developable piece of property where the clubhouse and, and current parking area is. Uh, for those of you who have driven by the site in recent weeks, we are allowing um, the construction company that is doing the Pomeroy Village Center roundabout to use a small portion of the uh, parking lot for staging. 
Um, we thought that was a good use and, and saves the projects money and, and increases efficiency. So the solar will begin in um, probably mid to late January, and we'll have some notices going out to, to abutters. Uh, even though it's not our project, it is our land. So we will be alerting abutters that uh, that project will be getting underway. It will bring in, um, I haven't looked at that pilot in a while, but um, my memory serves, it's about $65,000 to $70,000 a year in pilot payments for that 6.2 uh, megawatt array. Okay. Any further question on that, <clears throat> Kathy? Well, just now that you've pointed it on the map, how do they get to the solar array? Is there a bridge across the Port River? You know, I mean, it, the access. So just trying to figure out how this works and that developable area you had told us was seven to eight, eight, seven to eight acres. This was the information at the outset. Mm -hmm. So is the trail that is being developed, is, is it going to be part of that? Um, and would that mean that we wouldn't develop that area or, it, you know, I'm just trying to figure out how this site works um, and yeah, including and, how you get up into that upper corner. It's great. It's again, a very good question, Kathy, and, and give, gives you a sense. I was telling Paul just the other day, the, you know, the level of detail and the number of details that are involved. Um, you know, I, I listened to the, the Fort River uh, presentation moments ago, and I realized that's, you know, a, a very complex project, but this in the end is a very complex uh, project with so many different layers. So again, 150 acres, 26 acres of solar. There are seven bridges. These are cart, pa uh, cart path bridges uh, designed for golf carts primarily, but also for lawn mowers. Of those seven bridges, five are over the, the Fort River and two are over the uh, Plum Brook. Only one of the bridges over the Fort River was in uh, condition and, and strong enough to support the construction of vehicles, which would be fairly small. This is not a huge uh, building construction project, if you will. These are, these are pole mounted solar panels, but only one of the bridges over the Fort River uh, could even uh, pass the engineering studies with some improvements. So those have all been uh, worked through with the uh, inspection services department, as well as the fire department. And that will be the first project that will be done is, is a bridge to the right of this uh, screenshot that I, I showed you of the property will allow for north south access to the solar panel panels and that development. It also allows the fire department, the police department, anyone, even the DPW to go over that bridge in the future um, because we do have a cross country sewer line that goes across the north section of the, of the property. So this project will in no way uh, impact either the solar project or any uh, bridge access that we need. Um, there will be a north-south trail as well, um, and that was promised as part of the overall project. You may recall that one of the underlying, uh, uh, you know, um, um, pieces of this project was to connect those residents living in the neighborhoods to the north, um, up near East Hadley Road in Mill Valley in the Renew projects. Um, uh, I believe Renew owns at least one of the apartment complexes and then another one uh, to, the, to the west, as well as the Brook, um, as well as residents uh, north of East Hadley Road. Those, uh, those residents will now be able to access this incredible open space, as well as um, uh, the village center down at Pomeroy Village Center down near El Comolito, and uh, Mission Cantina and the, the uh, convenience store there. Um, and I believe Renew, um, Renew or one of the apartment complexes there has some um, uh, infill development projects underway as I, as I referenced a moment ago. So there'll be a north-south trail as well as this loop trail down in the Western section. Um, and of course we'll plan for parking to be somewhere along um, Pomeroy, uh, West Pomeroy Lane. Okay, Andy. Yeah, I was curious about one thing, Dave. Um, when you go down to the handicapped accessible trail that's near Popper's Pond along uh, what I guess is the, 
at that point, uh, maybe Cushman Brook, it um, is accessible from a parking area so that somebody who's wheelchair bound or very limited in, a, in mobility can still access the trail, but it looked like the way that the trails are laid out in that map that you've showed us, it um, does not have any um, vehicle access to the points which are marked as handicapped accessible trails. And I was wondering how that works then. Um, I may not, I may not understand your, your question exactly, Andy, but um, suffice it to say that at least in the short term, people will be able to park near the clubhouse from the clubhouse to um, from the clubhouse parking behind the, the old clubhouse is all bituminous pavement. And then we will pick this trail up, if you will, from the edge of that pavement west. So uh, the path will be accessible for people um, who have mobility challenges from the parking lot all the way west, um, down along the, the Fort River, et cetera. So, um, you know, ultimately what we decide to do with that frontage will need to incorporate some trailhead parking somewhere near the current clubhouse. As I mentioned before, our plan is to, is to raise the clubhouse, but whatever we decide to do in that area will simply incorporate some trailhead parking. I know in recent meetings, um, we've talked about the possibility of using Hickory Ridge. I believe Paul mentioned it uh, perhaps last meeting or the meeting before, but we've we've talked about whether uh, Hickory Ridge would be the, an appropriate site for a, a South Fire Station. And um, my staff and I are working with some consultants to look at some modeling for that now. And of course, that would be entirely uh, compatible with uh, some, some additional uh, trailhead parking. So we'll make sure that it's accessible from the current parking lot. And then in the future, if the town decides to move forward with, um, with a South Fire Station or a community center or affordable housing, uh, adding trailhead parking um, would be you know, part of that project. And if you could put the, uh, if, if uh, Athena could put the map back up again, there are two sections that are marked in yellow, which I understand to be the um, accessible sections of the trail. And one of them is along the river. Um, is that also accessible in the way that you described? Yes, the, so the entire green and yellow area will be accessible trail. So I, I don't want to say that just the yellow mm -hmm. is. The green is um, existing cart path. So we will be improving that. Essentially, we will be regrading and bringing in new product, uh, new crushed gravel, uh, compacted crushed gravel, crushed stone to make this entire uh, green, green yellow loop. Um, where I was referring to bituminous pavement, just beyond, I don't know if Athena can get there, but there's a, a small outbuilding. I can't control the cursor, but there's an outbuilding along Pomeroy Lane. Uh, keep going. Right. So right there is the outbuilding. That area, that section in front of the outbuilding in green is all bituminous pavement right there. So the pavement stops about at the blue line, and that's where we'll pick up this accessible new improved trail. So you'll be able to get out of your car over near the existing um, clubhouse, walk, or if someone is in a wheelchair or has a walking challenge, a mobility challenge, they'll be able to just go right where Athena's cursor is, is now. Andy, does that answer your questions? I think it does, and I think that what's confusing is the yellow and the green and the way that the yellow is marked on the legend, but thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, Anna, I'm sorry, I missed, I skipped over you, and I was looking in one place where you weren't next and another place where you weren't, so go ahead, please. That's okay. Uh, so I wanted to, Dave, two, two questions, hopefully, I think both quick. 
first off, congratulations on the on another grant. This is exciting. I'm. It's been so great to watch Hickory move along. Um, to confirm, the park grant is not you cannot be used at all for the rehab of the Fort River or the other elements of the um, the plan that was approved for conservation. Is that correct? It's it's strictly for recreational use, or will any of it be used for some of the cleanup efforts in the Fort River? No, no, no. The the park grant is 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 specifically for trails. It, yeah. it will not do any. We cannot use it for anything else besides the trail. Um, I think I put some of the narrative in the in the in the memo, but it'll be used for for the trail redesign and then trail resurfacing, kiosks, benches, things like that. Just making sure we couldn't couldn't use it for uh, turtles. Okay, so then second question is, what is the uh, distance of both the loop and the trail total from the parking lot? The loop, I. That's a good question. <laughs> um, I, I don't know the exact. Um, I don't know the exact uh, linear feet. I'm going to say that the full loop is at least half a mile. It may be longer than half a mile, and certainly from the parking lot, it would be more than a half a mile in that loop. And again, to Andy's question earlier, I think the the legend is correct. It, you know, the the. The green is existing, the yellow is new. We're basically connecting parts of the old uh, card paths with new uh, sections, and then we're rehabbing, we're resurfacing those areas that, you know, the, the, the course has been closed for three years. Nature has taken over some of those golf uh, paths. And so we have to work with the Conservation Commission as well as DEP, the Department of Environmental Protection, in addition, we also have to work with the Natural Heritage Program to um, navigate the layers of uh, permitting to get this done. And this will, I, I will say, I think it'll be great. I think it will be accessible. Um, it will not be a boardwalk. $400,000 to not give you a half a mile or three quarters of a mile boardwalk like right. over at the Conti Refuge off of Moody Bridge Road in, um, in Hadley. That is well over a million dollar, that's probably a 1.5 plus million dollar project now. So this will not be a boardwalk. It will be bituminous asphalt and then um, graded and, and packed down crushed gravel. Thank you. And are there, um, you know, never mind, it's not related to the park grant, so I will let it go. Thank you. Any other questions at this time? This is an automatic referral to the finance committee. Uh, so we don't have to take a vote at this time to do that referral. Dorothy. Um, the question is about boardwalk versus, I guess you said bituminous, which means tar, right? Black tar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I really do like the, um, I'm trying to remember what the exact name of the, the walk is in Hadley. I really do like the handicapped accessible boardwalk path with railings on both sides. Um, is there any way we could do that with, if we get another grant or something? Um, I, I think the short answer is, is probably no. Um, it would increase the cost, as I said, dramatically. The other challenge we face is that a lot of this is in the floodplain. And so adding building materials, adding wood, adding infrastructure like that in the floodplain is really discouraged. So there are times when this trail may actually be closed because it'll flood and we okay. fully recognize that. Um, but what we know from the course as we, you know, we've only owned it since March, but what we know is those car paths have survived decades of flooding and they're still there. So after a flood, we may need to run over it with a, with a mm -hmm. tractor, something simple, um, and, and, and it'll be as good as new. So, um, so putting in boardwalk, the, the risk we, we, we run with boardwalks is ice and water uh, mm -hmm. shear, have a shearing effect. Um, that's the case when we lost the bridge up at Amethyst Brook. You know, we lost a $20,000 bridge up there when an ice dam broke upstream on the Amethyst Brook and came down and sheared off our, our bridge. So um, 
you want to keep it simple in the floodplain, and that's what we'll do. We're not going to pave anything. We are there is no money for paving in this. We're going to use existing paved surfaces and then mm -hmm. crushed gravel. Um, some of the Conti, by the way, some of the Conti, um, you know, the parking area near the Conti refuge, and so there's a couple of sections that are are simply um, crushed stone, crushed gravel, mm -hmm. um, and they work nicely. Okay, thank you very much. That was very helpful. Um, thank you. Are there any other questions from the council? Okay. Um, I'm going to take one more item, and that's the surveillance um, use policy and surveillance technology impact report. We did vote already to refer it to TSO. Are there questions about it at this time? Mandy Joe. Thank you. Um, it re from reading the report and the proposed policy and the impact report, it appears that the current policy department directive 18 is being incorporated into the proposed use policy. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I have a couple of questions about that. Um, the two pages before that directive say that the surveillance use policy says that, it'll, that the, this technology will be used only for motor vehicle traffic stops. Um, but the directive itself says traffic stops, enforcement activities, and special events whenever a camera is available or the conditions warrant. And so those don't seem to mesh with each other. They're different uses. Um, and one of my concerns about that is that nowhere in that department directive um, is a definition or a description of what, quote, enforcement activities and special events, quote, means. Um, and in the directive, it allows for complete discretion and judgment on the officer's part to initiate the recordings during, quote, enforcement activities and special events, and doesn't describe what discretion, like, what it would be. And so I'm, I hope that any policy the council passes will define which enforcement activities, which special events they would be considered for, as well as what type of discretion should be used, um, you know, in terms of what circumstances should be present in order to turn that on or off. Because when there's discretion, that's what leads to inappropriate choices on when to use stuff. Um, so I hope that'll be taken care of in TSO, but that was one of my concerns. Um, it also doesn't define what a traffic stop is. So does that, is that really just, does that, are accidents included? Are any, or is it really just stopping of a vehicle for a tra motor vehicle infraction? So I'd, I'd hope to have a little more fleshing out of that. Um, and then I just had one other question, um, which is, it says, on public access. Um, I just, it, it read to me like, since the videos are kept for a minimum of seven days, that any video would be subject to a public records request and disclosure within that seven day request. And then if it's after seven days, only those vehicles that were only those via videos that were downloaded for evidentiary purposes would then be subject to public records request. And is that correct is my question yeah i don't know the exact answer to that so that these are really good questions we can prepare for that because i think what we have is an existing policy that the police department has we're overlaying our town general bylaw which has a policy and i think we're trying to we'll try to get those to mesh these are really good questions um in terms of public documents you know as long as you have a policy for how long you're going to store documents you have to follow the policy though and to, unless you have and so i hear what you're saying in terms of discretion for saving things and and as long as you have a policy but um we have to make sure that we're following that policy and then so if someone has a request or if there's a um something that happened that where the police department says we're going to save this recording it, it's all public records um that anybody could ask for okay. are there other questions Yes, Pat. A, a quick one. Uh, it seems to me this is set up only for traffic stops, but if this were in place for 
uh, responses like what happened on July 5th to a, new, to a noise complaint, we would have um, evidence to see what happened in the encounter that could be used by the public, it can be used by the police department and as, as counselors. So wouldn't that be a, an important thing to have? Uh, I mean, we've talked about body cameras, but mm -hmm. in this instance, we have something that could have been used to help us understand what actually happened. Yeah, it sort of depends where they place their cruisers when they show up and if they're pointed in the, and I think what they're told to do is when they, if they're doing a traffic stop and a policy, they're supposed to position the cruiser so the camera can see everything that could possibly happen. Right. They don't do that for noise complaints. They don't leave the, yeah. they don't turn, they don't initiate the camera activity for noise complaints. And is that but something I, I, that we want to begin to think about to avoid the kind of misunderstanding yeah. that happened around July 5th? I, mean, I, I know the police department would like body cams, but that's an expensive request, but that's a good question. We can bring the chief in to address these questions. Yeah. Okay. I, um, I just want to ask if there's any more questions and ask that those counselors that have raised issues or other counselors who might have issues that you make sure that you provide those to the town manager to me and to Anika as chair of TSL so that they get addressed during that process. Okay. Any other questions on this item? Anna. I apologize for the last minute. I'm trying to figure out um, and what I was trying to pull up and didn't have time, so now you're hearing my question instead of me trying to research it, is how often is this revisited? Because uh, I know our surveillance use policy is revisited. We get a report on it annual when we ask. Okay. Um, and uh, and so I'm, I'm curious if there's, so I'm reading things like it needs to be downloaded to a disc, um, which is which is lovely. And you know, if we had written this a couple of years ago, it'd say floppy disk, and that wouldn't be helpful anymore. So I, I'm just curious how we're making sure that this is uh, current and, and up to standard if there's not an automatic revisiting of it at a certain interval. Does that make sense? Thank you. Paul, did you want to speak to that? Okay. All right. Anna, that's another one of those questions. I'll bring it to TSO. Thank you. And you're on TSO. Yes. Uh, are there any other questions with regard to this item? Again, we voted earlier for a referral to TSO. With that, we're going to take a 10-minute break. Well-deserved, gang. Uh, we will reconvene at, um, oh, well, I'm going to be generous. We're going to reconvene at 7.30. <laughs> Please turn your cameras off and your mics off.
Lynn, would you say that again, please? Because we are muted for people on Zoom. I'm sorry. Would you repeat that, please? Because oh. we were muted on Zoom. Okay. Uh, please turn your videos on so that we know that you're back. Waiting for Pam, Anna, Alicia, are you back? Okay, Anna. Yes, I am. Here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Anna, I see that you're back. I'm uh, back. I had an interesting email, and I just want to point out, you know, we only ever talk about how the, who's on Zoom and the number. But many people watch us on Amherst Media, but we don't know those numbers, which is just unfortunate. But um, I want to thank um, the person that wrote in and reminded me to acknowledge that. Okay, um, we have two other action items. One of them we are not going to take action on this evening. And that is um, the town manager goals. Instead, there's two options. One is if you have thoughts about the town manager goals, please send those thoughts to, I'm gonna say Michelle and Mandy Joe, okay? And then um, on the 4th of, of January at nine o'clock in the morning, we will post the meeting as a committee of the whole so that all counselors can join and have some discussion about uh, items that have not been resolved within the town manager goals. But Michelle, who is chair of, how are you, Michelle? Uh, who's chair of GOL is going to highlight for us those items that are still unresolved and quote, in the parking lot, okay? Yeah, and I, I just wanted to acknowledge that I, I think the the process um, has been a little bit unique in that Mandy has really um, taken the draft and, and revised it as we've moved along. So I'm not sure if I saw Mandy grabbing her microphone when you suggested that folks send. OK, because Anika is also the, the vice chair of the committee. So I just wanted to um you know, just at least acknowledge that this process has been unique in the sense that Mandy as a committee member has been helping um, in a significant way on the goals. Um, and I did prepare just a little something to say that I think mostly Lynn has covered. Um, the latest draft is in tonight's council packet. So um, you can look for it there and it has recombined the council policy goals and the management goals. And just to reiterate what Lynn said, at the last GOL meeting, we went through the document, we created a parking lot for items that need more discussion, and I'll review those items in a moment. Um, and also to reiterate that on January 4th at our GOL meeting, it will be a meeting or a committee of the whole um, where we will continue discussion of these items. Um, so I'll start with the policy goals that we've pulled out, and I am going to share one or two sub goals just to give people context if you're listening. So um, the first policy goal that we pulled out is climate action. Um, this goal currently includes, for example, support for a waste hauler bylaw and actions on the CARP plan. The second we pulled out is community health and safety. This goal includes revisions to the residential rental bylaw and options for a youth empowerment center and programming. That, that's not all that these include. I'm just giving a couple items for context. Housing affordability is the third one um, in the policy goals that we've pulled out. This includes ensuring the operation of a permanent uh, seasonal or year-round shelter, and a newly proposed sub-goal to develop strategies to address Amherst's, Amherst's declining non-student population. Management goals. We pulled out uh, personnel management. This includes to retain, recruit, and develop a highly qualified, diverse, and effective staff, 
And this is where we have the um, fostering a proactive anti-racist culture throughout town departments. And uh, we'll have further discussion on that. Um, there's a new management goal that was added, municipal services. It doesn't say much right now. Um, and then we have infrastructure management, maintenance, and land stewardship. This goal includes uh, to propose a five-year capital improvement plan in accordance with the charter, and then uh, like the creation of a multi-year plan for long-term improvements uh, to maintenance of public parks, conservation land, recre recreation land, et cetera. And the final item that we pulled out is relationship with the town council. And this goal includes to assist and support the council in providing policy leadership uh, to provide appropriate support for council committees as two examples. Um, there are notes from town manager Bockelman in the current draft that's in your packet. So you could also take a look at those. Um, and as Lynn said, please do send us um, anything. If you aren't able to attend the meeting, please do send uh, comments to myself and to Mandy Joe, and we will be back at it on January 4th. When would you like to receive those comments by? Um, I think it would be good to receive. So if somebody knows that they're not going to be uh, available to come on January 4th, um, I know with the holiday, it's really it's really difficult. But what do you what do you say, Mandy? If we're trying to kind of incorporate them into a discussion, uh, I mean, um, I would say Friday because I could then do a little bit of work next week trying to draft or create a new draft based on any comments on this draft for the GOL packet and the discussion the next Wednesday. It would, you know, that could get posted late next week. I would say. Um, I had my hand raised up while I've got the mic. I've already received comments from two people on this draft, so they don't have to resend them to me. I'll make sure that they get forwarded if they haven't to Michelle. I'll make sure, Michelle, that you get a copy of those. So you'd like them by Friday? Uh, this week. December 23rd, 20. COB, close of business. Yeah. Okay. All right, Kathy. My, my question was mainly answered um, in terms of the way we send you comments or questions. Um, is it easier to do a set of bullets or is it easier to do track changes? Because one of the things I'm concerned about is I don't think we should be Christmas treeing this. It might not, might not we're Hanukkah bushing it, um, but by just adding everybody's in, um, you know, I think in, in some places, if we want to slim it back down, so just what, what is easier to work with? Michelle or Mandy Jo? Um, I'm in Mandy Jo, yeah, answer that. <laughs> it, it, it depends on what the, what the goal of your comment is, right? If it's, you really don't like the wording, attract changes with new wording um, is great, but if it's more of a holistic, this set, or I would prioritize take climate action, for example, where, there's a lot of comments about a lot has been added. You know, if it's a comment about I would prioritize these two over those three, that can just be a bullet, right? And I'll work, I do my best. And sometimes I just add a comment in that says some people want to delete, other people want to keep, you know? And so I think it depends on what the basis of the comment is. Thanks, that helps. Okay. Are there any other questions? Seeing none, then I, what I'm going to do is send this out as a reminder uh, and who you send it to and by when. And also a reminder of that meeting on the 4th. All right, uh, thank you. And I, I know GOL has worked hard on these goals and this has not been an easy ride. So I really wanna thank you for this effort uh, and, um also thank the town manager for being willing to let us not quite meet our December deadline, but I hope we meet our January 9th deadline. Uh, it's only fair. Um, financial guidelines, Andy, I know you and Kathy and the finance committee have worked hard on these. And so we're prepared to take questions or comments, but Andy, do you want to start? 
Yeah, I'm going to start with just uh, one introductory observation, uh, or maybe two, uh, because the first one is that we really did work hard on listening to, in very carefully to all of the comments were made, collecting notes from all of the people who had taken careful notes and made sure that consideration was given to everyone and uh, went through several discussions, several different meetings. And then um, because I had taken the prime role as drafter in the first round, I asked Kathy and she volunteered very graciously to be the principal drafter in the second round so that there'd be a totally separate member of the committee working on the next draft. Um, and so I, I just wanted to make that point on process. The other point that I wanted to make is that the hard part of drafting the guidelines in the end is just the financial reality that we're in, that you always start a budget with the amount of money that's available. And the um, lessons that I've learned over the years is that because of Proposition Two and a Half, and because of the way the legislature works, we're kind of at a slow, steady two and a half to three percent increase each year. And that generally uh, worked because, uh, you know, it kind of matched what the natural inflation was that comes along. Um, in this past year, with inflation being six percent, but the growth still being back at the prior level that I described, it cre it's creating a real challenge and it's gonna be a real challenge um, when we hand this off to the town manager and say, okay, now um, here's our guidance, go develop a budget and present it to us at the beginning of May, which is what the next steps are in the process. He's gonna face this challenge too that uh, in a year of high inflation uh, and the other pressures that we've talked about that are on the budget, it is a very difficult year. And so some of the language that I think that uh, some people are concerned about is just sort of warnings that uh, we can't create an imbalanced budget and uh, that is where we are. And I think that that was the general sentiment of the committee. And one other thing I'll share as part of that discussion is one of our resident members, Bernie Kubiak, has been involved in municipal finance for many years in various roles, including as a town manager. And he pointed out something that I thought was a, an additional point that adds the complexity to this. And that is that in general, because of the nature of how we spend money, what we spend money on, which is heavily related to personnel, um, municipal uh, cost increases year for year are greater than the uh, consumer amounts. Mm -hmm. And so when you put that together with what I just said, it really is a challenging period. So I don't know, Kathy, if you had anything else you wanted to add. Okay, are there comments or questions? Because we are going to move with this, with a motion tonight to adopt this. Michelle. I want to acknowledge I'm a member of the Finance Committee, so I've been involved in most, most of these discussions. Um, but Andy, to your point and just building on that, I received a few emails um, from residents who were concerned about some of the language, like you're saying, the sort of cautionary language. Um, and I wondered one, if you could um, just briefly describe what it means. There's um, a paragraph that says the town will likely need to forego taking on some new efforts and less revenue neutral until we have the funds needed for the major building projects required work on roads and sidewalks determine the long-term public safety plan and have the staff needed for the three public safety departments. Could you quickly say what it means um, unless revenue neutral um, and 
um, I think this is just building on what you were talking, uh, you know, about uh, in your opening comments, and that there does seem to be some concern in the public, not necessarily um, in disagreement that that this statement is is not true, um, but that it may give some ambiguity in terms of uh, the town manager's uh, sort of discretion versus um, the policy goals that we have created as a council. Yeah, no, that's a good point. And that is uh, what I was concerned about because it was that exact section that I know that has created some confusion and some questions. Um, maybe the easiest thing to do is to start with uh, the example that was uh, I thought about when I drafted that sentence originally, and that has to do with the waste hauling regulation. Uh, the waste hauling regulation would be a major change in how um, waste hauling is done if it is um, as um, the sponsors um, would like it to be. But the reality when you get look at the finances is that um, the, um, the, that the amount that people are now paying for trash hauling from a private hauler that they're contracting with uh, directly will still be charged to um, the residents who are having their trash picked up from their homes, but it's going in, it, it would presumably go into uh, the uh, appropriate enterprise fund and the enterprise fund would then pick up the costs of um, running the system and uh, contracting on behalf of the entire town with a single hauler. So uh, we haven't done the arithmetic because we haven't worked out the whole proposal yet, but it is conceivable. And I think, uh, you know, at least um, more, re more likely than not, that it's going to work out exactly as I described and that the cost of the system is going to be picked up by um, the amounts that's coming into the enterprise fund, which for the homeowner will be um, hopefully um, some uh, neutral and so that everybody comes out in the exact same place. So that's an example of a kind of major initiative that probably, not definitely, but probably can be done totally reven revenue neutral. And uh, on the other hand, if it is something that has to be entirely picked up by um, taxpayer money or other money from the budget itself, and there's no new revenue coming in, that's where the problem lies. And that's, I think, the distinction that I was hoping uh, to at least signal. So I hope that answers the question. It does. Thank you. Okay. Dorothy. <clears throat> well, I guess my hope is that um, some things that have been talked about, such as the Youth Empowerment Center, could be worked on, um, and not necessarily committing funds till we have them, but um, I'd hate the thought that they aren't even moving forward at all. Um, under these guidelines. And um, so that I, I'd like, I think I need a little clarification there. Uh, so that's it. Andy, do you want to address that or go to the next person and then come back and address more than one item? I think that, that one can be addressed fairly quickly because um, I think that uh, there, there's various questions that have to be answered and talked about, and I think that they need to be talked about and can be without delay. Uh, are we talking about a physical building that's a new building, which would be quite costly, or are we talking about programming and what kind of programming? Um, so there are issues that can go forward and should go forward with development because this isn't the um, goals section that uh, GOL is working on to present 
back to us in January. This is uh, solely around the budget. And uh, so we need to just be very clear as we're working through the goals part is to what can be accomplished without um, significant budget investment and um, choose to emphasize those to the extent that we need to be cautious. Jennifer? Yeah, I guess I had a question along those lines. You need to turn your mic on. Oh, it is. Um, I have a question along those lines, which is, um, should this should this um, sentence or two be in the budget guidelines, or is that part of the discussion we would have in setting the town manager goals if we agree not to set a goal that is going to increase the budget, so to speak? Um, I guess that because I kind of think it goes without saying that if we can't afford something, we can't do it. Um, yeah, so I, <laughs> I'm wondering if this has to, it seems very open to interpretation and it is cautionary, but you know, when we're setting the budget, if we agree that we want to try and be revenue neutral, that would be maybe the place to have it. I don't, I'm just wondering if it needs to be in this document. Yeah, yeah, Lynn, can I just respond? Please, Kathy, go ahead. You know, these are finance guidelines. These are not the same as town manager performance goals. So I think what you're saying, Jennifer, is right. They are, you know, we, we've given, the town manager keeps good notes on what we're hoping to get done. And I added the words either next year or over a series of years. Um, I was astonished that we were able to bring in CRESS and DEI when we looked at it a year and a half ago. We set it within, we, and suddenly there were grant monies found for it to get it started. There was a phase in that made it affordable. So think of these as the finance guidelines um, and, and pick out those sentences and over when we talk on January 4th, um, if we are putting things on a, where we actually expect it to be done next year and it's got a big price tag, we might wanna say maybe not, <laughs> but, the beginning thinking on something. It, and so Andy's example was a good one. Um, so I, I think that's just, um, I, I ran in 2018 on a, we're gonna have to make hard choices because I just couldn't see how with step increases alone going up 3%, health insurance going up at eight, now pensions up at 11, two and a half percent is really tight unless there's something we don't want. So that's that's what the guidelines are. It's just you know trying to pick out guidance to give the town manager an ability to balance out. And he's gonna to have to come tell us where I got this much in in the following ways, but I couldn't get this in in FY24. So I think, you know, like I've heard from, you know, some constituents also, I think the concern is because climate action and affordable housing, you know, isn't specifically mentioned something we're going to work on that there's a feeling that maybe it's going to be excluded. Right. And I just want to say, you know, most of the affordable action, the big pieces were the purchase of uh, the shelter was ARPA money and the big housing projects have not taken a lot of town tax dollars. They've taken CPA dollars. So this is, he's got one piece of the budget over down the down the hallway, there's a committee that's handling our 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 CPA money, and that's where the big dollars have come on the housing side. Um, so just trying to think of where where is the money coming from? I mean, look what we just did with trail systems, that leveraged a CPA grant into a lot more by bringing in one. So to, the the public understands that yeah, we're so not leaving anything out. Yeah, with this wording. Yeah, this is this is the. Budget for the revenues we know that are the town revenues. <laughs> yeah. I think that if you look at what we've built before, what we're proposing to build at the East Street School and on Belchertown Road in the property we bought, that um, one, once the land is purchased, then the uh, land is made available to a developer that's chosen in a process that um, our staff administers. And uh, the developer is 
taking on the responsibility of seeking funding, which comes really from a combination of sources. Kathy mentioned CPA. Um, usually there's funding that comes from the state, from e, um, executive office of housing and community development. And uh, there may be um, loans. And uh, so the, through a combination of resources, the housing um, moves forward without further town, significant further town investment. Some of the energy is the ones, it's going to be more difficult um, because I'm not sure that we have the experience yet of knowing where the grant money is um, and what kinds of sources there are, but uh, we hope that they will be there. I think in the end, uh, my final thought is that uh, I hope that uh, Paul, who's just sitting there trying to uh, keep uh, be quiet on this. Um, if he doesn't feel that we've given clear guidance, I think that it would be important to hear from him that uh, the, the guidance isn't gonna, isn't clear enough for him to give him the guidance he needs. Did you want to comment, Paul? No, I think the guidance is helpful and, and I think it is clear. I think what will become more important in many ways is going to be the goals of what the council wants to accomplish because those goals have to fit underneath the financial guidance that you've provided. So um, that's where the hard co conversation is going to happen, I think. Anna? So the last thing that Paul said was actually one of the things on my notes is how we crosswalk these, right, with the goal. I know we've, we've been talking about both of them, but for example, the policy, the budget guidelines give a lot of airtime to pilot payments, which is hugely important and will be a major topic of discussion. And are those emphasized as strongly in the goals? So are we are we kind of backing ourselves up here as, as much as possible? Um, I appreciate the end of section seven where it talks about timing on the, on the budget uh, process. And I think that is sure to be a very, very rich discussion about what that looks like to to think about our timelines with these um, and where there's latitude and where there is not and how we incorporate feedback and not. Uh, I also appreciate the in inclusion, I didn't write down the paragraph, sorry, but of the chart of reexamining the charter formula and where that charter school formula and where that led me was thinking about the, the people who are on the CC list of this um, document, it doesn't include Joe and Mindy. And there's so much in this that indicates the future directions that we will be going with ideally their support and help. Um, and so I would encourage us to consider adding them to the list of folks we send this to so that they, they know what we're gonna be coming to them for down the pike as well. Right. And I know they're paying, I, I know that they're listening and watching and paying attention and just sending a paper copy might also be good for us. Thanks. Right. And as we um, indicated in the, um, as I indicated in the president's report, Nana, you were at the meeting, we've talked about having a meeting with them in January that would be a little bit longer to talk about the priorities of the town and particularly where legislative action might help us, grants might help us because they have been enormously successful in helping us get grants be, and along with our amazing staff who where I'm, I, I'd like to hire them out as grant writers anytime. They're very good. Um, let me just say, I look at this and to me, it is a crosswalk with the goals. And I think the thing we often lose sight of is that planning and getting things ready for prime time costs money even if we're not going to do it. So when staff are spending time on a planning effort, on a rezoning effort, on a any number of efforts, it's it costs money. It's their time and they only have so much of it. So as we look at these, that's one piece. The other piece, in, and this is, again, I'm gonna go back to, the staff have been amazing at bringing in grants for everything. I've never seen such a list for a municipal government. It's just astounding and we should be very, very proud of them. And they continue to look for that. 
The other final thing is they also continue to be innovative. Innovative. Where can we get a piece of money here and a piece of money there? And how can we put that together? And that allows us to redo something or allows us to move forward. And that's what, you know, if I were to rewrite a state of the town address, it would be to say a serious appreciation to our staff who have been able to cobble together the path through grants and planning that have allowed us to achieve the kinds of things we have already done and the things that we have yet to do. And it, it's just amazing to see it. So I just, I don't, I don't think we should give up a hope that we can do some of the things that are still in the goals. I think we just have to realize the timeline and we have to factor in what does it take in terms of staff time to get us to that point. Thank you. Um, Michelle, you're next. Yeah, I, I guess what I'm hearing, I just want to clarify, is that we're in, so Anna asked about crosswalking, and we had a, a few discussions about that as we've been working through this process, and I'm on GOL and finance, so I've had the benefit of hearing both, um, but what I'm hearing is that the guidance that we're looking at right now is essentially going to, or should inform the town manager goals. Um, and so just to sort of drill into this a little bit, if we get to January 4th and we're continuing our discussion of the town manager goals, are we now saying, okay, what we decide to include or not include is or should be informed by this budget guidance that we just agreed to and that we just voted through um, without Actually, because I, I heard town manager Bachelman basically say that's where the tough discussion is going to happen. And what I'm not clear about is, does that mean the discussion of adopting town manager goals or does that mean when town manager and staff is developing the budget, uh, that's sort of where the rubber meets the road. And so how do we reconcile, you know, what we do in the goals if we, how do we give town manager Bachelman, um the guidance that shows uh, sort of if something needs to fall off, this is the thing that should fall off? Or is it just that uh, he then decides based on, um, you know, his own expertise or, or knowledge or, or whatever? I'm more than glad to let someone else take a stab of it, but let me try this. They're all interrelated. Yeah, exactly. The budget is interrelated to the financial goals. Is it interrelated to, interrelated to the policy goals? And that is interrelated to back to the budget. It just right. continues. So uh, I think the issue that we'll have to face with the policy goals is when do we expect and how do we stage it? And that kind of the realization of the expectations of when are things going to get done? And we all see everything on that list as urgent based on the perspective we bring to them. So that's the January 4th discussion. Okay. Yeah. Jennifer. I just, because our staff is so amazing at identifying and getting grants, if there was something on a goal that we didn't think we had the revenue for now, and I know that staff time is money and that a lot of time goes into applying for grants, but could something be on the list in the hopes that maybe there'd be funding. Yeah, it's like saying it's a... Yeah, I mean, we when we set out to do CRESS a couple years ago, we started out with, the town manager came to us with four responders. And then it became apparent there would be a state grant available. And that allowed us eventually to introduce to eight. And so it, it's there's an example of where a grant made the difference. I guess that's the best way to answer. Yes, Pat. It was suggested that there be four responders. We changed it to eight before we got that, that grant. Mm -hmm. It was changing it to eight that yeah. got us the grant that made that yep. looking right. for that grant happen. So, right. um, 
it isn't that it came afterwards. It, so I, it, it, the, his goals and the financial stuff is very, um, I think you have to put out there what you want. Yeah, I agree. But, <laughs> but there realistically has to be, at the same time. There also has to be agreement among us of what we want. And then I'm going to just offer one other caution, and that is we also have to be very clear of what it is we pass and what burden it's going to place on our residents and make sure that we're not basically making decisions and then passing cost on to people that they weren't planning on. So um, anything else, Pat? Okay, I'm going to put the motion on the floor. Uh, the motion is to adopt the FY24 fiscal guide guidelines as presented. Is there a second? Shane seconds. Any other discussion? Seeing none, I'm going to start with Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Abstain. Pam Rooney. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Aye. Alicia Walker. No. Okay, so we have 10 in favor. Uh, one no, one abstention, and one absent. Okay. Um, thank you. We're now going on to committee and liaison reports. Mandy Joe, CRC. Um, thanks for passing a whole lot of zoning tonight. <laughs> and I'll, I'll just say um, thank you to all the planning staff um, for working with us to get all that through and for all the time, particularly with flood maps that has been spent getting it to where we got tonight. And tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., our interviews for ZBA associate member candidates on Zoom. Okay. Elementary School Building Committee, Kathy. As you saw with the timeline, um, the next big item on our list is the cost estimates for the more specified design, and we expect them back um, end of January, uh, end of December. But we'll be meeting on them on the 9th of January, uh, that Friday, and then again we have three meetings in a row scheduled that will be focused on what we got back. Uh, so, and I will make sure everybody knows those times. But that's the next big item. I, I should just say one other thing. I didn't say it. In, this design team is also, it's it's on a, a land with uh, wetlands uh, and floodplains. They've been meeting with the Conservation Commission. They've done a really good job on checking and cross-checking. They met with our safety folks to worry about the circumference of the school, easy access if there's an emergency. So there's a lot of behind the scenes including meeting with all the teachers about how they want their room set up. Where do you, do you want the video screen on this wall or that wall? Do you want a video? So, so it's been a very involved process beyond just meeting with the committee. Thank you. Finance Committee, Andy. Uh, yes, um, there was a Finance Committee report that was submitted and I think that it's covered uh, most of the issues that we've been working on. We do have a meeting scheduled for tomorrow at three o'clock. Um, it, if you look at the agenda that was posted, it's quite long, but that was because um, I had to post the agenda prior to the last meeting because of uh, the fact that it was actually just two business days between the two meetings. And as a consequence, um, I put everything that possibly could be there <laughs> with the idea that we may not have to get to it at all. And my goal is actually to make it as short a meeting as possible because the committee really has been working very hard. But uh, one thing we definitely have to talk about is a matter referred earlier this evening, and that is the Hickory Ridge funding, uh, because uh, the staff is uh, 
particularly anxious to get closure on that. Uh, we finished the 457 Main Street VFW building recommendation. It is in the report, and I assume will be on the agenda at the next council meeting. So that's taken care of. Uh, the sewer regulations, if um, the DPW staff gets back to us with any information about insurance that might be available that would affect rates, uh, then uh, we will need to come back to that before um, finishing our work on it. Um, so that may be an active discussion tomorrow. And uh, it's possible we could have some discussion about the residential uh, property transfer fees. Um, we're not, I'm not certain about that yet, but I, that is something that needs action in January if we're going to do it because we need to get it, if we are going to do it, we need to get, get it back to you as the council because the council has to vote to ask our legislators to file special legislation and that's not a matter that can be delayed. So um, I think that's kind of a quick summary. Thanks, Sandy. GOL, Michelle? Yes, I also submitted a report. Um, we, I'm not gonna talk about the town manager goals. Uh, we looked at the sewer regulations um, and I just wanna thank uh, the superintendent and assistant superintendent and everyone else who worked on that. Amy really uh, looked at the water regulations um, in order to put the sewer regulations into um, a, 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 a format that was very helpful for our review. Um, we did have some questions about the civil penalty section that we need to seek some um, clarification on, and we'll be giving a final review of those along with the water and sewer bylaws also on January 4th. Um, we also discussed bylaw 3.40, snow and ice. Um, definitely recommend you look at the report if you haven't. It was an interesting discussion and um, generally we feel the bylaw is strong, but there are some concerns that we're trying to work out in terms of um, enforcement and, and some other things. So um, I think that's about it. Okay. Um, Jones Library, Anika. Okay, so I do think that uh, uh, Library Director Sharon Sherry covered a lot of this, um, but our last meeting we were able to see um, some updated floor plans and we revisited both the schematic, um, well, the schematic um, design development and documents and bidding phases. Uh, we were able to go over the design development schedule along with um, the committee meeting schedule as well. So um, it was nice to see in terms of like the floor plans um, um, coming together and you know, really seeing the, um, the proposed project come to life. Great. Uh, are there TSO, uh, Anika, that's you as well. <laughs> All right. So uh, we had a we had a um, our meeting was this past Thursday and it was nice we had a um, overview and by uh, town manager Balkelman and discussion around um, the proposed um, sorry the why I just went blank I'm sorry universal composting so we had a really nice um, discussion around that and really you know thankful for. Um, the manager's updates and also the counselor sponsors and all of the work that's gone in around that. Um, we also had an overview and discussion of the proposed water, water and sewer uh, by, uh, bylaws that was led by Superintendent Amy, Assistant Superintendent Amy, Amy rather, and would like to thank her. She's kind of an honorary member of TSO. Thank her and Anna for all of their work around that. Um, and then we also had, as we're past um, tonight, some great discussion around the appointments that Paula Buckman had put forward. Um, really a great range of people. I believe there were at least two that were trilingual. Um, great, you know, age variation, um, you know, 
economic and ethnic backgrounds it was all over the boards. So it was really nice to see that type of um, diversity coming in. And I'm sure that all of them will have a lot to add to those committees. So thank you again to Manager Paul Bacham. Did we just lose a counselor? No, we're fine. Thank you. I thought we just, somebody just logged off and I saw, wasn't sure. Uh, are there any uh, liaison reports? Kathy. A really quick one on CPA because they actually succeeded in going so long that I didn't watch the last hour or so of the meeting um, after four hours. But one comment I wanted to make on the amazing staff we have, um, they had way more with these two terrific housing projects on their plate and other worthwhile. It looked like they couldn't do it all. And they, he came in along with Dave Zomack in a way to finance it with a path forward to gave them some choices they didn't think they had. And watching that, when you talked about, it wasn't even a cobbling together, it was saying, you know, they don't really need this much because we had this much money over in ARPA and we can do this and together it gives them enough money. So um, that left them with changing their votes about some projects because they, they thought they had to choose one or another. So uh, just kudos to your staff, Paul. Um, on a, it wasn't even a, you should do this. It's like how you could do it if you wanted to do it. He really stayed neutral, but it was fabulous to watch because the committee was literally grateful. They said, oh my gosh, this is great. <laughs> when when CPA comes before us, I think we're gonna all wanna hear a little bit more about the magic, Paul. <laughs> um, Pam Rooney. Hi. Um I have been um, willingly and diligently attending um, planning board meetings. Mm -hmm. There has not been that much in the way of policy, which would take our time. And usually it's at, you know, 1130 at night. So this is just a you know nice early evening uh, to bring you up to date to some of the incoming things that the planning board, um, excuse me, the planning department um, is working on as reported. And the design guidelines for the town center are uh, something that um, were requested and desired several years ago. There is an RFP that is drafted uh, that would get a consultant in to do this work uh, with lots of community involvement. Um, at the same time, another wonderful grant came through that has to do with uh, sidewalk and public space improvement for $75,000 that the department uh, obtained. And so the revision of the RFP for the larger design guidelines is going to try to incorporate the additional money and the additional scope that the $75,000 can, can afford. Um, the Boltwood garage is a question that has come up a number of times. Can it be added to? And apparently the contract has been signed with the engineering uh, firm that actually uh, designed the Boltwood garage to begin with. Um, that that answer is not back yet. Um, the, the question about evaluating other alternative sites for a parking garage has not been started. It was deemed... Um, not a, it's it's a voluntary thing by the planning department rather than a directive from town council. So at some point it would be appropriate to have town council vote to ask them to kindly look at alternative sites. Um, all that said, I would note that the planning department lost two staff members within the last couple of months and they are down to two whole people. Um, the director and senior planner, which means there is a huge burden put on these two people. So things I think will need to take their time. Great. Any other liaison reports? Okay, then I'm going to move on. We don't have any minutes tonight. I'm going to move on to ask Paul, is there anything you'd like to report on? So two things. One is um, I will be doing a written town manager report monthly from now on just to sort of 
because it takes a lot of time to put them together and it seems to make more sense because so much I think if you noticed that a lot of it was repetitive and so doing it monthly I think is, is will be better use of time we're also uh, setting that out as something that people can subscribe to um, and if they would like to receive it we send it out automatically the second is I appreciate Pam bringing up the um, staffing challenge for uh, the planning department we lost two very highly qualified um, planners um, both went to better jobs. Uh, one went to Mass Dot, making significantly more money. Um, and then Maureen, who's who I had a long conversation with her. She was really torn about going, but she had the opportunity to become planning director for the, the town of Montague. Um, and so um, she loves working here, but this is just an opportunity in her career that she had to follow, I think. And I, I appreciate it. I supported her actually on that. Um, but it does mean, as Pam said, there's two staff left. If it's a four person department, it's Chris and Nate. And um, we're triaging that, like, because, you know, neither of them expect, you know, Ben and Maureen did not think that either one was leaving when they were pursuing this. So, um, and just in terms of the grants, they are great grant writers, but those are the folks who were writing a lot of our grants. So that's going to come to a, a halt because we, we have to digest a lot of the stuff that we that we brought in. And quite frankly, the, the state was pushing out a lot of money in the last few months. So we want to be there to, to grab it um, and be receptive to it. But given the, the staffing challenges, I think we're going to have a hard time seeking more grants at this moment until we bring new people in. But I think we'll get some really quality people. It's a great department to work with and we're in a good location to attract really quality people. So, so it'll be a challenge for a bit though. And I appreciated Pam noting, noting that. Are there any questions of the town manager? Kathy. Just, I have a really quick one, Paul. I don't know whether we have over or in your experience um are there people that are experienced at grant writing for municipalities that could, that could be hired on a temporary basis just on a you know uh and i don't know how how that might work but um because i totally agree there are things rolling out and i don't want to miss you know the scan <laughs> um yeah, there are people do, who do that. There are people who previously worked for the town. More likely, we would use them for um, writing opinions because of the writing opinions and uh, or decision, not opinions, decisions for the ZBA and the planning board takes an enormous amount of time. So utilizing people who can listen to a recording and then do the first draft of a decision is probably the best use for our consultant. And, and Chris has, is starting to work on that and getting somebody online to help with that. Dorothy. Do we have any formal goodbye ceremonies for staff that leave? I mean, you know, some really good staff is leaving and retiring, and uh, I'm just kind of hoping that we can celebrate them in some way. Yeah, so the staff tend to do that for themselves, uh, quite frankly. I mean, there, you know, they there will be an event tomorrow for Maureen, and it's potluck. We don't put, you know, the town doesn't put money into these events. Uh, that's not really what taxpayers give us money for. Um, and so, you know, the but this this town hall is pretty good at doing potlucks, um, and so they'll they'll do that. I think tomorrow is the day uh, for Maureen's farewell. Um, and it tends to be more of a staff oriented. Uh, event that they, that the department organizes on behalf and and they they know they're closer to the individual they know what the individual wants um, mm -hmm. it's an, you know if we had someone you may have a re, a, a person retiring after thirty five years of service come the spring we might want to do something a little bit bigger for something like that okay. yes. well just just let them know that they will be missed exactly yes absolutely Anna. Yeah, this is a really, really important critical question, Paul. Um, I'm, I'm curious what you plan on bringing to these potlucks. I'm just kidding, you know. Well, you know, that. it's interesting because I they had what they have a it was food day for the first floor today, and I asked Sean what he brought, and he said he was instructed to bring hot chocolate from Dunkin' Donuts. So that's usually where where our that sounds uh, like people don't really trust set. Sean too that's much on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually do have a real a real question. Uh, when you're recruiting for these, you said that we typically have a a broad applicant pool, which leads me. I know we have a wonderful new human resources director. Do you do any sort of data collection on the diversity of our applicant pools that we get here, and are those reports? Yeah. So. Uh, you know, um, 
they do collect, if people self-identify, they can collect that data. Um, we, I can see what kind of that, what kind of information is available. It's a really good question. Um, yeah. And I'm not saying it's necessarily something that council needs to yeah. be, be involved with. I was, I was more curious from your end, if that's something that I, I trust that we get amazing applicants and I'm curious about, about that element. So, so there's two things. One is applicants and one is how are applicants um, treated. And so I, we have a standard and we were starting to go through this a little bit more in detail um, before the previous HR director left about uh, we had a policy of uh, anybody who identified that as um, a person of color or uh, uh, or in another way we would interview them automatically so there was no pre prejudgment so everybody would get an interview um, and then there was we were having discussions some people felt that was not appropriate and almost and so it's just sort of a, a frank discussion about is that really the best way to do things or not and we're trying to learn a lot from uh, Doreen Cunningham, who was on the call tonight. She's really good at um, recruiting and interviewing, and we're learning a lot from her uh, in terms of how the school district does it. The school district does a really terrific job at recruiting and in hiring. So, thank you. Any other questions? All right, then uh, we're going on to town council comments, and I did um, submit a president's report. It was covering two months. Uh, if I were to direct you to focus on anything, it would be the summary of the comments that uh, of the discussion that we had with Joe and Mindy. Uh, we tried to be as comprehensive about that as we could. Um, and that was very recent and helped provide some guidance, particularly around the issue of the transfer fee. So are there discuss are there questions about that? Michelle? I don't have questions about that particular piece, but I do have two requests on the um, report itself. Is this okay? Okay. okay. So um, I see that under the town manager and other town staff, I think it's page two, but I'm having a hard time. Um, you, I think, put in the um, four meetings uh, that happened with the police department, two of which counselors attended if my dates are matching up right. So I'm wondering, or I'm requesting that you would add some language that would make it um, knowable by the public that in those two meetings on December 1st and 2nd, counselors were in attendance, um, or if there's some other place where that should go, um, maybe that's a better option. Um, and then the other request is just like with the meetings with Joe and Mindy, I would like to see um, a bulleted summary of the discussions that occurred in the meetings with the Amherst Police Department. And again, so that it's transparent to our community um, given those meetings happened, I think there was um, concern that those meetings were not uh, known by the public. And so I think it would help if we were able to provide just some summary basis for what occurred um, in those meetings. Thank you. I'll have to do that obviously as an addendum to the report. Thank you. Are there other questions or comments? Okay, then. The next item under the president's um, report is, let me, before I go on to the role of the, no, let, actually, let me go on to the role of the town council president and vice president. This is something that the council has done every year. So it's not like all of a sudden a new item. We've always asked the president uh, to talk about their role and answer questions and the vice president, the same thing. My response is to go back to the charter. And then in addition to that, by looking at my report, you get a sense of what I do as president. Um, and I've, been, I've been doing those reports now for about a year and a half, I think, or maybe a year, like something like that. So um, I guess at this point, I'd ask if there are questions. The reason we do this is because on January 9th, we must elect 
a president and a vice president of the council again. Um, and this is a way of understanding what you're looking for. So I guess we'll start with questions on the role of the president. Michelle. I have a quick question. I was looking at the charter that uh, the, the excerpts that were in the packet. Um, so this is per the charter. Are you asking us to look at um, only the charter or also to consider what is in our rules and regulations? I know it's what's here supersedes that. I, but I've actually included excerpts from both. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. Cause, yeah, because there's a whole lot in the rules as well. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay. And I'm not seeing any hands or questions at this point. Uh, so meantime, I'll just ask Anna if you would like to talk particularly about your role, and besides the fact that it's to fill in whenever I'm not able to. Which, you know, I got to talk at the dog park opening, which was great, but feel free to go on vacation more. Um, so <laughs> my husband's suggesting that, uh, you know, I mean, I think that the role of the role of vice president is very vague in in its definition. Um, and so I think what I've sought to do in this role has been to sort of expand a bit uh, on not on the definition, obviously, as that's defined by the charter, but uh, as presiding in the absence of the president. I get a sentence, um, but also to think about, you know, how do we ensure that there's there's another voice at the table? And given the limited uh, limited scope of the vice president by definition, um, you know, trying to trying to have someone there to support as well as challenge Lynn in, um, which I, I mm -hmm. do believe I do both, uh, in in meetings that you attend um, as well as you know supporting you in. Um, agenda setting, et cetera, et cetera. So the role itself is is sort of what you make it. Um, and I've very much enjoyed it because I think that it's been uh, a, a big learning journey, which has been great. So for example, one of the things that Athena, Athena, excuse me, Anna has done is she now joins us for the monthly meetings with Senator Comerford and Representative Dom. And we actually, along when I can remember, asking people what things they want to make sure we cover. Uh, Anna contributes significantly to that agenda. She also participates in agenda setting meetings when she can in finalizing agendas um, and also in rehearsals when she can. Um, those are places where I think that Anna's input perspective and you know different ways of looking at things have been particularly valuable to me. Kathy. Um, I have a question of uh, both of you and also a, a comment um, on agenda setting. You started a practice of asking counselors if they would like to attend some yes. of the agenda settings. And I have raised my hand and my husband says, don't you attend enough meetings um, and wonders why I'm doing this. But I found them extremely valuable for at least a couple because it, there was a more of a discussion of what was possible to get done and what was the most urgent to be on the next agenda, you know, and, and, and so on a, just on a, how much that's been a learning curve. And so I, I think that's a good practice. And I guess um, if you could think of ways of, if people want to allowing a few more opportunities. So would it be impossible to have two counselors there in addition to the two of you, you know, not hitting the quorum um, to, to hear those discussions? Um, and it's a bit from the building committee when we're doing agenda setting with the designer. It's funny what people are ready for, what they're not. <laughs> And getting a when will it, would it be ready? So it's it's a plan, you know. It's not making decisions. So that was one, and then opening up the meetings with Joe and Mindy. Um, and I don't even know what I think would be reasonable, but I've sent all my thoughts about the school and state 
financing and I've tried to steer away from others, I've sent them through you rather than directly. Mm -hmm. um, and um, in the first years, I sent things, things more directly, I had the thoughts about tax policy and got direct responses. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how much they like it coming through a channel so they're not getting each of us versus cultivating those relationships is a good thing to be cultivating, not mixed signals, and or opening up some of those meetings. So is it uh, if you meet X monthly, doing it every quarter? So again, it's it's a it's a question rather than um, a strong suggestion. Just on the first one, I I personally have no problems with counselors attending. We just have to watch quorums, quorums of committees of the council and quorums of the council. Uh, I. I find it actually very um, positive in terms of the input and understanding what goes into setting up agenda. I'm looking around. I know several of you have attended um, this last year, and I don't see any reason to change that. And if we can do two counselors as well as Anna and myself and not have a quorum of the committee, I'm looking at Athena. She's rolling her eyes. Uh, <laughs> So, Athena, you want to speak to this? Um, I think when we get to 2023, um, we can all work with the new president to see how we want to set that up. Right. Um, I did send a poll at the beginning of this year, and we had various counselors join us for several meetings, but there were plenty of dates that we didn't have counselors attending. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of as a, you know, as counselors want to attend, we fill those dates up. So if there are particular counselors that want to make sure they're on the list for next year, they're welcome to email and, and that'll be a good reminder. It's a good reminder. Thank you, Kathy, to um, remember to set that up for next year. Mm -hmm. Okay. So on the issue of the meetings with Joe and Mindy, I think adding a whole lot more people would not work if we were going to have a meeting with them about specific topics. We might even just want to schedule it as a council meeting and have them come to the council meeting. They would love to be invited. And uh, maybe that's something we should discuss with them when uh, the group meets um, in January. So. I would I would agree with that. It's really the the calls with Joe and Mindy are really kind of running down a list as fast as we can and in a very limited right. amount of time. And so um because we we build up a lot, I think it would be a great idea to actually ask them to join us for a meeting so that we can mm -hmm. and have that be a regular practice. Yeah. Um once or twice a year to at least to do that. Yeah. Ask okay. Are there other comments? All right. Um, yes, Michelle. Thanks, Lynn. Um, so if, if we have, uh, recommendations about, um, for example, how the meetings are being run or how we might have shorter meetings or any one of those things, um, and we want to somehow get those incorporated is the time to address those after the election happens in January with the new president and vice president, or is the time to maybe send them to you now and then somehow have that be, you know, I think either time is fine, but I think part of the reason we have this discussion is so that people understand what the expectations are of the position. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I see a town room. Yes, go ahead. Um, GOL is charged with an annual review of the rules, just as a reminder that that, that happens every year. And that's, the, I, I think, a good opportunity to make some of those changes and suggestions in terms of rules. Did you hear that, Michelle? I did. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. That's helpful. Yep. Okay. Are there other comments? Thank you. Okay. So I have one other point that I just want to bring out from the charter, and that is um, each of you, we all, each of us, serves on committees. Those committees continue until a change is made and the earliest any change would be made would be by the second meeting in January. And 
I've also had a counselor ask whether or not we might relook at liaison appointments. But all of that is what gets discussed on January 9th after the election. But if there was any question is why, do I still serve on this committee until whenever? And the answer is until January 23rd, you still serve on that committee. Because I know you're calling meetings and working on stuff. Are there any other questions or comments? I can talk a little bit about future agenda items. Uh, Athena? Can I make a very quick announcement? Please. Um, some of you have already met some of the new minute takers that we have, so I'm really pleased to say that our council committees are all staffed with minute takers, and we'll have a new minute taker here with us at council meetings starting in the new year. So thank you for welcoming them so warmly so far. Great. And Thank you for spending time hiring them. Anika? I was just going to add that I forgot to thank um, Minute Taker. What is, I forgot her first name. Last name is Miller. Kelly. Kelly, yes. I forgot to thank her in the report. Thank you for that reminder. So you've already had a, one of the new Minute Takers at TSO? Yes. Excellent. Um, so on terms of future agenda items, let me just find my. So on January 29th, I mean, January 9th, I'm sorry. Uh, Athena, we agreed we do not need to do a public forum regarding the park grant. Okay. Uh, there's the election of officers. There might, by that point, be a presentation regarding the strategic agreement with UMass, but we're not, we won't know until they let us know. Uh, there's a discussion regarding committee appointments and also liaisons. I clarified earlier that we do not need to revote ranked choice voting submission to the legislature. Mindy clarified that for us. Uh, the uh, purchase of the property on Main Street will is coming from the finance committee and ready for action. Uh, the fee or transfer of property might be ready for discussion. We'll see. Um, and the town and there will be a recommendation from the finance committee regarding the park grant. And then uh, obviously the town manager's goals. And uh, beyond that, are there any other comments? Councillor comments at this time. Pam. Um, could someone just uh, give a recap, very brief recap of what the MMA annual meeting is all about and, you know, what, what would one gain by actually going to it? I'm going to call on any counselor who has been because we have not had an annual meeting in person since two, 2019, no, 2020, we had one and then the state closed down. So, counselor, want to volunteer? I've been to all of them, but Andy. Yeah, I've been to all of them as a counselor, plus I was to a number of them as select board members. So uh, I find that they're very helpful um, in a couple of respects. One is that it gives the opportunity to interact with people who do similar work in other communities who you don't normally have an opportunity to meet. And it takes a little bit of personality of your own to be able to see that hey, there's a counselor from another city that's of similar size. Why don't I stop and talk to that person and ask them uh, what their experiences are and uh, what the challenging issues they confront. Um, there is a difference that we always have to remember, and that is that uh, there are few cities in Massachusetts that have town managers. Most of them have mayors. And the relationship between a mayor and a council is very different from our experience. So you do need to be careful of that. The other thing is just that there's num that you should look at the announcement in the MMA, MMA website about the uh, sessions that are being offered because there are sessions that um, 
are uh, provided that uh, are put together by people who give a lot of thought to what they're going to present and um, have very good discussions. And it's the opportunity to really learn uh, about what other communities are doing and how, it, um, how it's taking place. And I will recognize the fact that uh, my first exposure to composting as part of uh, collection was that um, there was an MMA session on it that I attended a number of years ago when I was on the select board. And it was uh, something that stuck. And uh, so you do learn things as to what's going on in other communities. Uh, and frankly, for most of us, if we go as a group, we end up getting together socially a little bit and see each other uh, in a non-meeting context. And that actually has a tremendous bonding capacity amongst the group that's coming from here. So those are what I observe as the benefits of going. Dorothy? Well, Alyssa was the great guide the first conference. And um, she suggested come on Thursday night and um, so that you're able to register on Thursday and you're there for everything bright and early on Friday, uh, where your Friday morning is speeches, 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 then it's the woman's lunch. And then it's very interesting, as Andy was saying, very interesting uh, workshops afterwards where you learn either other towns are doing the same things you are doing or other towns have new and interesting ideas like turning old fire stations into theaters, which I'm still waiting and hoping to do. Um, so they, you know, just you kind of wait on that. Um, there are also um, speeches from the, the elected officials. There's business meetings. Um, oh, and one of the uh, workshops is on PFAS and how to deal with that problem. Um, there's also a, I forget what they call it, uh, where they, a part of the convention hall has all kinds of exhibits and you go around and you see things and meet people and you pick up interesting little things that you might be interested in using, which they, they give out free. Um, so it's a nice hotel. The Heinz um, Convention Center is convenient. And, um, you know, when I was there, totally immersed in the conference. And then if you want to see more of Boston, you do that afterwards. Um, this time I can't come Thursday night because I was just given a class which meets Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and the second class of the semester will be Friday morning. So we will teach that early morning class and then zip there and be there hopefully by the woman's lunch. So I look forward to it and I hope it doesn't get canceled. Yeah, it did at the last minute last year. Mandy Jo. Um, Dorothy mentioned the vendor thing. One of the things I find valuable is being able to talk to the vendors. Um, you wouldn't think as a counselor, that's nice, but vendors include not people necessarily selling the municipality stuff, but state agencies. So you can talk to the MSBA folks. You can talk to the MBLC folks. You can talk to our town attorneys and ask any questions you want, which is something I always hunt them out for. Sure. Um, you know, and so, so just being able to have those conversations with entities that we're dealing with to ask them, you know, like for MBLC to ask them why this procedure or what can you do, then you can have that direct conversation with them. I've always found very helpful too. Anika? I just wanted to add that um, Angela Mills has been really helpful with um, offering to, you know, help sign us up, those of us that haven't had the experience to know, like, what our must do's. And so that, that's been really helpful. Thank her for that. Yeah. Okay. Any other counselor comments? Any other future agenda items? I'm going to make it. It's going to be under nine o'clock, gang. Yes. Um, I want to wish you all a happy holiday. We started yesterday with Hanukkah and we move on to more of the Christian holidays and Kwanzaa and whatever you and yours celebrate. Uh, thank you. And the meeting is adjourned. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Yeah.